I promise you suffering, Yuri. You came here with a security. Wait, what? Yuri Dude comes in and cries. Like in the movie Alien, he was arching. Did you have any moonshine in Kaftanchikovo? When I see Krovis Stok, I'll give them a piece of my mind. You shouldn't have said that. Well, come Alexei. Yuri budget, dude, dude, budget, Yuri. Alexei, how are you? Much better than on August 20th. Uh, your arms and legs work fine? They said your hand well, was... Well, my hand's still shaking. If I attempt to drink water from a bottle, then you'll see a little bit of a show. It'll look like this, but I really get better every day. I'm working with a physiotherapist and today he started to teach me to juggle, so after some time, you'll see me juggling and riding a unicycle, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Well, well, I just need to do a lot of like left or right exercises so to remind my brain to function properly. You see, like, the joke does damage to the nervous system, and... Uh, there was a recovery period, but everything will be fine, and I'll get better. Did you get up by yourself? I mean, without... Well, people didn't care at me. I no, got no, 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 like supporting you or... No, 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 no. Well, that period is over when they supported me. And it's been, it's been quite a while, I guess. I mean, it was. It was a really unpleasant period when I just started getting out of bed. They brought a chair to the sink for me. I sat on the chair like to, to wash up. It took me three minutes. And then I walked back to the bed, and I lied down, and just looked at the ceiling in terror, thinking, how long would this last? And then I just started to eat, and then I recovered quite quickly. Doctor said that they were surprised that I was recovering so quickly. I'm like a guinea pig now, because very few people survived uh, this lethal chemical weapon, you know, and there's just monitoring how quickly I recover to be able to better help other people like me in the future. You became a human test subject. Yeah, something like that. Uh-huh. Tell us what actually happened. Uh, I'm ready to stay silent for as long as it takes and listen. We are in Moscow. We want to, excuse the expression, to take down United Russia. We realized that we will take it down with smart voting, which we will actually did in the end. We destroyed the symptoms and did very well in Novosibirsk. And we prepared an investigation, which issued some footage in Novosibirsk and Tomsk about local scammers. And we knew that many local people would watch it and respond to the call to participate in smart voting, which would hurt United Russia. Good people would become deputies. Some bad people will stop being deputies. It took us a long time to prepare. Then we eventually came and we spent a lot of time shooting in Novosibirsk in several different locations. Then we went to Tomsk. Um, of course, on our way there, the police stopped us. It was obvious that we were being closely watched, but nobody bothered us. And in Tomsk, we also filmed in several locations. In general, we did nothing special. We'd film, then return to the hotel for the night, and then we'd film again. And then it was time to go to Moscow. My show comes out on Thursdays. And uh, uh, and so it was Thursday, right? I woke up early in the morning in a great mood. And, uh, well, the day before, I'd, I'd go to swim down in the Tom River. In Kaftanchikova. In Kaftanchikova. By the way, everyone in this village now, I didn't know it was called Kaftanchikova at the time. Super dark riverbank, dark water. It's one of my hobbies. Uh, where, wherever I go, I like I uh, when I went to our uh, to our Hangels, to our employee at Shevden in a court hearing. When we came to Tomsk, I said, "Take me somewhere for a swim." I I got into the water to sort of check out like the dip tier two box in Kaftanchikova. As it turned out, got back to the hotel, went to bed. Woke up in the morning feeling good, we took a shower, got dressed, went to the airport. Everything was great at the airport. I felt fine, bought some candies. I mean, I went back trying to recall the exact moment I first felt bad. I remember that I felt perfectly fine uh, at the airport because my only concern was I should bring some candies from Siberia for the kids. And I got on the plane, uh, and then uh, I was rubbing my hands, anticipating the three and a half hours of peace and quiet. And I opened up my laptop and put on Rick and Morty, and it's my laptop routine. I started watching Rick and Morty, and it's also why I know the exact minute I started feeling sick, like w- when it started getting bad, because I opened up my laptop, and after... Shouldn't it be tucked away during liftoff? Uh, that's a great point. It was a regular flight, and I was waiting to hear, oh, just put it away. But this time they just glanced at it and said nothing. And I was watching, and I was... Um, and I'm telling you everything because okay. this is important, right? Um, I was sitting there watching Rick and Morty, and despite having seen every episode like a hundred times, really, I and I was just completely engrossed. I have a great time, and I was like, "I'll watch this." Then, and then just like around twenty minute mark, I 
was oddly no longer invested in Rick and Morty. I felt like drenched in cold sweat. You know what I mean? It's a really weird feeling. Several people ask me, like, how does it dying from Novichok feel? It's hard to explain because it's... It's unlike anything you've ever experienced in your daily life, you know? Like, there are things that you've never experienced, thankfully, like like a heart attack or having your leg hacked off with a chainsaw. But you can sort of imagine what having your leg hacked off with a chainsaw is like. Here, you're you're covered in cold sweat, and you feel that you're you're so... You're so unwell. I felt sick. I mean, look, like, most people have been so sick at least once that they thought, like, this is how I die. This sensation of, this is how I die, kept coming in waves again and again. My press secretary, Kira, was sitting next to me, and I thought that she might think that I'd lost it. But I closed my laptop and said, Kira, can you talk to me? I wanted to focus on her voice because my mind was all blurry. You do this when you suspect a stroke, right? Well, I mean, I don't even know because uh-huh. I was thinking, I was sitting there thinking, like, what is going on? It wasn't, it wasn't the heart or the stomach. You couldn't, like, normally when you feel unwell, you can sort of, like, scan yourself and say, I've got a heartache, my stomach or my leg hurts, or I have a headache, right? Or I caught a cold. Here you couldn't figure it out. So I said, talk to me. She looked at me surprised, said, okay, and started talking. She was opening her mouth and saying words, but I couldn't really quite focus on them. Uh, and if flight uh, attendant was pushing a card, and I thought, let me grab a drink. And then I thought, no, I'll just go to the bathroom and wash up. That should help. And I went to the bathroom in my socks, washed up a couple of times, sat down for a minute, and I sat and... I thought, I'll just sit a little bit longer, then realize I'm not walking out of here if I do. And then, you know, you're trying to, like, make sense of it later. And this may sound weird, but the closest analogy I found were the Dementors from Harry Potter. Rowling's description is, uh, a Dementor's kiss doesn't hurt. It just sucks life out of you. It It didn't hurt at all. But the main overwhelming feeling is, I am about to die right now. It's pretty hard to, like... You don't experience this in normal life, thankfully. Chemical weapons are banned for a good reason, actually, because they're truly terrifying things. All these, like, nevichoks, organophosphates, and the like. And I came out and I saw a bunch of unhappy faces, and I guess I, like, started thinking, like, maybe I've been in there for, like, 10 minutes and people kept waiting, right? And I realized that I should probably ask for help because I didn't think that I could walk back to my seat and to my own surprise. I turned out to the slide attendant and I said, I was... I was poisoned. I'm I'm about to die. And I just lay down in front of him. And this sounds really like this is this is this is crazy, right? And the flight attendant just looks at me with a little smirk like, what a nut job. Maybe he maybe he thought that I got food poisoning from tomato juice or the pasta. And I think that I mean I think that maybe he was about to, to tell me, I guess, that they shouldn't have poisoned me on the plane, but I wasn't listening at all. And I'd lie down on the floor, determined to die there, and then because this feeling that it's like Your entire body is telling you, Alexei, it's time to say goodbye. You've done something to me that is 100% incompatible with life. I lie down, and they were asking something. You lay in their kitchen behind the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I lay down right in front of them. And they were asking me something like, sir, what's wrong? Is it your heart, sir? What's going on? The last thing that I remember was uh, the commotion in the words, sir, stay with us, stay with us. And then it all faded. Um, these I saw these videos with, with harrowing titles like Navalny screams in pain on the plane, you know? Yeah. I was evidently shouting, maybe from, uh, maybe from hallucinations or something, but I can't remember it, and it didn't hurt at all. But it's worse than pain. This feeling that you're like you're 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 done, or the other word like where which I can't say in here in all caps. These huge letters roll over you, really like just roll over you, and you realize it's like this is it. It's over. So so I guess in a way I even like I um, I mean I mean I mean I can't say that I'm surprised when I came to again in in, in the in the hospital where I was. I guess but but. But on the plane, I was certain that it was it. For better or for worse, my my family's faces didn't flash before my eyes. Neither did my entire life. It was nothing like that. 
Some spooky numbers coming up. One of the saddest things about modern Russia is her immigration statistic. According to the UN, 10.5 million Russians lived abroad in 2019. We're in the top four behind India, Mexico, and China. Right below us are Syria, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Additionally, over half of young people between 18 and 24 say they want to leave Russia. The exact figure is 53%, according to the last year's survey by Levada Center. It's the worst it's gotten in the last 10 years. But there is another solution for those of you who wish to be a part of the bigger world. You can stay at home and work for a foreign company. To be able to get a job like that, you want good English. It's a vital skill for our crew, too. It enables us to select our subjects and work outside of Russia freely. That's why we keep our English in shape with Skyang. Good afternoon, Yuri, and welcome back to Skyang. Uh -oh. My name is Zilga. When I was a teenager, I used to hand out leaflets leaflets to earn a bit of cash. What is leaflets? Oh, it's like flyer, yeah? Yeah. It's interesting whether uh, Zoomers knows uh, the, the word flyer. Some of them do. Really? Oh, okay. I think that it's a it's a word from nineties. Thank you. It was nice to meet you. And bye bye. It was nice to meet you. Yeah. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. If you wish to improve your English too, Skyang is currently running a special offer. The bigger the package, the more free lessons you get. If you pay for eight lessons, you get two more for free. If you get 16, then your bonus is three extra. With 32 and 64 lesson packages, you get four more for free. You can claim your free lessons at your first checkout or using the promo code UDITS. This same promo code also works with the recently introduced premium plan as well. This plan already has a separate class for IT professionals and automatically includes Skying's talk clubs. If you're a parent who got alarmed by the fall break this year, where instead of one week they get two, you're in luck because Skying also has English and math classes for kids and teenagers at Sky Smart. They currently offer special discounts as well. If you pay for four English lessons and four math lessons, you get a total of 12 SkySmart lessons. Learn more by following the link below. Click the link, sign up for a class, and don't leave Russia. Yulia, how are you? I'm good. Much better than a month ago. How was it a month ago? <sighs> scary, probably. What do you want to hear from me is that it was scary. It was scary, yes. But rather, the first thing... I can't find one word to describe this feeling, but it was always a feeling of don't take it easy. Don't let your guard down. Mm. Where were you and what were you doing when you received the message? Um... There was a call from Kira. Uh, I was at home. It just happened that Alexei was supposed to arrive at 8 in the morning, and I offered to meet him at the airport myself. Oh, so you were planning yeah, to? Yeah, I was planning to. So I woke up early. I saw it because I usually turn off my phone at night, so I heard this call at 6.40. Luckily, I wasn't asleep yet, so I picked up the phone right away. Kira said... Yulia, stay calm. Alexei has been poisoned. The plane was forced to land in Omsk. Oh, wow. Well, it's like saying, tell mom everything's fine. I'm Approximately, in yes. It was like that. Well, it was brief. Everyone was, and she was in shock. She was supposed to quickly convey the key information, too. I said, all right, not all right, but okay, and uh, hang up. Then I thought, probably shook my head. I don't remember if I shook my head or not, but emotionally, I definitely shook my head, closed my eyes, called her back and said, wait, what? I probably must go to Omsk. And she said, they say he might be fine in a day. Maybe you shouldn't come. We'll fly ourselves. I said, no, I'll still go. I quickly checked the flights. Another stroke of luck, besides waking up early, was that uh, the flight was in two hours. I grabbed my suitcase, grabbed my things. I 
Um, I'd been packing like this for the first time, didn't fold anything like just into the suitcase. It was like shown in the movies. I pulled something out to the closet and threw it in the suitcase. Later, when I opened it after a day, I found some dresses, skirts, <laughs> some strange things. I was surprised myself that I brought them because I just uh, threw them into the suitcase, closed it, and... Uh, I bought the plane ticket in the taxi. When I called the taxi, sat in the taxi, I told the driver, you know, my flight is in two hours. I have to make it. He was surprised and, and asked, uh, didn't the people you're flying to warn you in advance? <laughs> I said, well, the situation turned out the way I could. No, I've just found out. He drove me very quickly with no issues. I have never insisted on breaking any rules. We were lucky there weren't many cars on our way. I arrived and realized I, I of course, was thinking about something else. Basically, I still had two and a half hours before the flight. I just uh, miscalculated it was in three hours, not two. About half an hour or a bit more, he drove me. Um, he drove me to the airport and I had to wait for this flight at the airport for two and a half hours. And this perhaps was apart from the plane itself, waiting um, for this flight and the plane itself. It was almost the scariest thing, except for the moment when I saw Alexei at, uh, at the airport. It was... At first, Kira called and said that uh, the plane was forced to land in another city. Well, it was clear planes are not just forced to land in another city. Something serious was happening. But then her next text message was, Alexei is in a coma on a ventilator. Then it became clear. And I was just at the airport already, and it became clear that the situation was critical enough. And I went to the cafe. I sat down. And... Mm -hmm. I burst into tears. I mean, I wasn't crying per se. I couldn't hold back my emotions. I wrote to a friend. She said, do you have black sunglasses with you? I said, what black sunglasses? Why would I sit in black sunglasses? She said, find black sunglasses. And I happened to have black sunglasses in my bag, the bag I took with me in the morning. I put on these glasses at the airport. I ordered myself whiskey at 8 a.m. <laughs> 50 grams. Well, maybe I felt not that it got easier or the opposite, uh, but I let my emotions go, so I burst, uh, burst into tears. You said that you survived thanks to the pilots who landed the plane and the emergency team who gave you an antidote shot. Yeah, they operated a according to protocol. I mean, the beauty of this situation is that they operated perfectly according to protocol. Really, that's what they were had. The pilots were told that a passenger was about to kick the bucket and they landed the plane ASAP. The paramedics were told the guys out, they confirmed it and injected atropine. And the emergency team there showed up and they said, yeah, he looks like an overdosed junkie, really. He clearly has poisoning. He uses atropine, take him to the detox clinic. And they did everything the protocol required perfectly. But, I mean, you know how Russia is. When everything goes according to protocol, what, it is a series of lucky coincidences. Sadly. But probably the scariest thing was to get on the plane and realize the flight to Omsk takes about four hours. So to understand that four hours, you're cut off from any information. That was a really frightening moment. And I was flying with Ivan Zhdanov, the director of FBK. Fortunately, he also managed to catch this flight. And I can't say that I'm a person who talks all the time. And as the guys later told when they asked, uh, how was your flight? He said, it was fine. Yula talked for four hours without stopping. I told him about the children, about one, about the other, about the family, about all our family affairs. Probably spilled all the secrets to him. We haven't asked him yet what I told him in those four hours. It probably took quite a while. But I was afraid to stay alone by myself or at least a second, and to start thinking, so I needed to talk to someone. And it was also scary to land, because at this moment I was about Text to, messages. Yeah. And what those text messages would be. And I tell Ivan, 
uh, you look at them and from your reaction I'll know. And of course he's nervous too. He takes the phone, looks at the screen, then scrolls and puts it back, then looks and I see that he has a tense face. And well, at the moment, I, I even told him, Vanya, is everything bad? Just tell me now, because I wanted to pull myself together on the plane and exit the airport looking normal. And he, uh, on the contrary, it seemed to me, my thoughts were that, well, he's afraid to tell me on the plane, because when we exit the airport, there will be some doctors. Um, if um, it was unclear what my reaction would be, I thought he was silent because he wants to take me somewhere where they can provide some help to me. And I tell him, tell me the truth, tell me the truth. What is coma like? What does it feel like? Uh, like no. nothing? No, you don't feel anything in a coma. What's sleep like? Um, we remember things at night as we doze off in bed, um, and then the alarm suddenly wakes us up. If we didn't wake up and slept well, we don't remember anything in between. Was it like that for you? I mean, when you came to in a hospital bed at Charité, the last thing you remembered was being on the SM. No, yeah, the, that's how it is in the movie. You're unconscious, and then you slowly open up your eyes, and you see your smiling family, and someone with a bouquet goes, Welcome back, Alexei. You kiss them and reach out with your weak arms, and it's nothing like that, at least in my case. There's a special pilot uh, report that they fill out in case of emergency, and and I think mine said that I was in the deepest level three coma on the coma scale. There's like a Glasgow coma scale. 15 is when you're normal, three is when you're totally unresponsive. And I scored a three on this scale, and you're completely out. It's not like dreaming either, really, at all. I was in a coma for 18 days, 18 days of heavy drugs. And then they got me off of the drugs. So I guess I think that I probably experienced half death, then coma, and then some drug. The hallucinations, really, in this whole drug trip were by far the worst part of this whole experience. Um, it was totally like uh, Pilevin's books or Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and I saw the uh, deep end of it, you know what I mean? And it was worse than in the books, too. It was really bad, and I can't imagine actually paying money for it. I went through several stages of, and I can't even tell for certain right now which things happened and which didn't. For example, for a while, I, I lived in this reality in which uh, my wife... And Leonid Volkov came to visit me and said, Alexei, you were in a terrible accident uh, in Berlin. And we we brought a professor in from Japan, and he was standing next to them, and he'll give you new legs and a new back. And for some reason, he looked like this this like octopus dude from the first Spider-Man movies, you know what I mean? Well, wait, so you were seeing all these things, right? I didn't just see them. They were as real as you are. That was my reality for several days. Obviously, that conversation never happened, and I probably saw it when I was either still sleeping or sitting up with an open mouth, uh, like not recognizing uh, anyone in the room. And it's possible that I had super interesting conversations with them in my head, but they didn't Japanese react doctor in the car crash. Yes. Oh. Uh, that was the most pleasant, uh, not even hallucination, it was semi reality. And I knew that I was in a hospital. I'm unwell, and I'm back from a coma, but also the car crash and that the Japanese professor would give me new legs. And at night, I'd alternate between dreaming and hallucinating. Then this car crash reality slowly faded away, and I went through several different stages. And then I started to understand on the level of senses that Yulia was coming to visit me. Like, she's adjusted my pillow, and it was very important to me. Like, really, and I identified her and always anticipated her. And this was another step. And then something else happened. And I guess I started to recognize people. Like when they told me that Leonid Volkov told me about this this, this hilarious episode, right? It had a, week been like a week after you had already regained consciousness. A week awake, yeah, and, let's call it. And these hallucinations occurred when you were already awake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they'd sit me up. And I'd sit there and just stare at one spot, right? They kept talking to me, and obviously everyone was afraid that I'd stay like this forever. And they'd say, Alexei, it's Novichok. And he said that at some point I looked up and was like, what the crap is going on here? Without using the nicest language, what the frick is going on here? And she looked back down. And that's when I knew, he said, that she would be okay. But it took a while. Like, for a time, I knew what was happening, and I recognized, and I talked to people, but I possessed by the idea that 
I fully recovered and said, get me out of here. And today I know that it was just another hallucination. The scariest hallucination was about the band Kravastok. Uh, and I even knew that they were hallucination as well. I'd fall asleep, and when I see Kravastok, I'll give them a piece of my mind. And I'd, Sergey back there is a and fan. I'd get teleported into a cell. And they would tell you to, like, list the house rules, which were, like, some lines from a song by Kravastok. And it lasted indefinitely. You you recite them once, twice, but then they ask you like 10,000 times again. And until you answer, I guess you don't answer, like you, you're not allowed to sleep. That was the worst. I think in my case, all this drought tripping and hallucinations weren't about like pink elephants or talking bunnies or anything nice. It was, it was actual real torture. I mean, drugs are bad. I, and, and I, I, again, I can't imagine someone paying for it and enjoying it. It was, it was like really, really, really bad. I think. And Yuli told me another funny one. I was obsessed with running away. One of the first things that I remember is trying to get out of this bed and all covered in tubes and wires. Uh, you know, and so I ripped the tubes out and gushed blood all over the place. And nurses had to rush in and put me back down. But they didn't tie me up at all. They told me later that they discussed trying me up and decided against it. And I could already talk to my wife. And the doctor came in and we talked and he left. And then I turned to Yuli and said, go take his gun. We'll bust out. You know? And, and that was when I could talk. I knew that she was my wife. I could say some words. It's like a ladder that you keep climbing. And first you reach the point where you can, like, like my speech pace is back to normal and I can write again and I can read again. And I can do it, all of it, and I still have difficulty doing some certain things, but I'm recovering pretty fast. Typing? Much harder. But I, I relearned it. I started using the computer two days ago. My typing kind of looks funny, but um, my oh. son Zahar started to train me in CS uh, Go, and it's a fun means of, um, of recovery. Helps of, fine motor skills. Uh, yeah, it really does. Reaction, too. It really helps your reaction. So it's a ladder that you keep on climbing. And if you're lucky to be in the hands of good doctors, then you'll climb all the way to full recovery, if you're lucky. But if you're unlucky, then you'll be stuck sitting in a chair with an open mouth with people unable to tell if you can understand anything, any, like, uh, uh, any signals or not. What was the most challenging in the hospital? To see him. To see him and realize that the situation is probably even worse than I uh, expected. To see fear in the doctor's eyes, who are afraid to tell you something, clearly holding back, clearly hiding something. But of course, uh, the scariest thing was to see Alexei in a, in a coma. And he also had seizures. It's like in the movie Alien. He was, he was arching. You mean in the hospital? Yeah. yeah, well, I don't know how it happens. Some um, muscle spasms or something. And it was terrifying, of course. But I understood that I couldn't relax because in this situation, I'm his closest person, his wife. If I fall apart, everyone around will start falling apart one by one. So I tried, I tried to pull myself together. And it was scary when I went out and one of the doctors, not administrative staff, so to speak, like chief doctors, deputy chief doctors, mostly those who communicated with me or rather whom they sent to communicate with me, I guess, but the doctors who actually worked, so one of them said to me in the corridor, what a tragedy, hold on. And you know, when they say that, it's almost expressing condolences, so it was scary. And with every moment we were there, I realized that I had to take him away. I had to take him away, I had to take him away, not fall apart and take him away. Get him out because they won't give him the care he needs. Uh, Why because, so? Because they won't tell the truth there. Mm because it was visible. For example, where I came to the chief doctor, they led me to him. There was the chief doctor, the deputy chief doctor, and a woman who, not a woman, a lady, uh, who is the deputy minister of health of the Omsk region. 
Then another deputy minister of health came. Well, it was such a very strong administrative pressure. And I also told them, excuse me, I don't even want to talk to you. I want to discuss this with the doctors. I generally didn't understand why there were so many officials there. How did this poison get on you? Nobody knows. First off, do we know if it was liquid? Nobody knows. It's it's super secret stuff. Uh, and having access to this poison here, this substance of the chalk itself is, it's a chemical warfare weapon. It's banned. You can't store any amount of it anywhere at all. And these days, really, like, you know, nobody, one of the problems for Putin is that it's not so much about whether he's the one behind this or not, but that it's a proven fact that someone in Russia... Uh, obtained Novichok and used it, but that it's a proven fact that someone in Russia obtained Novichok and used it, which itself is a violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention, it can be a spray. It can be a liquid. It can be in contact form. One current uh, uh, understanding is that I left my room poisoned after touching the water bottle, meaning that I was poisoned at the hotel. And uh, then, like, uh, which is where it was. But then three or four hours passed, which is a long time. I had, like, a drunk, eaten or inhaled it, I would have bought the farm in 30 to 60 minutes. Instead, it took quite a while. Meaning you only touched it? I either touched it or, I mean, I couldn't take, like, a shirt off a hanger. Like, I touched the hanger and voila, it could have been my clothes. It could have been anywhere, really. That's why, that's why it... It's called a chemical weapon. Organophosphates, in general, are not, are really not that bad. They're diclopores, right? It's one of them. Only to get diclopores poisoning, you need to drink a bottle of it. And they'll still save you. Uh, And the point of chemical weapons is that they consist of several components that are each harmless on their own. Also, you only need a a tiny amount to kill somebody with it. But most importantly, it dissolves in the body completely. That's why they kept me in Omsk for so long. And they waited for it to dissolve inside my body, wanted all traces of Nevichok to disappear. But they miscalculated it. They kept you there to wait out the breakdown process. Is that your theory? My theory is, it's not even a theory, it's its my wife's and everyone else's account of what happened in Ops, and I'm really grateful to them for straight up fighting for me, but every, I think evidently that their first hope was that I'd just die there, you know, and they hoped that I'd either, uh, either die or turn into a vegetable. Or, at the very least, all traces would be gone. And their plan was to keep me there as long as possible. And the doctors that shipped me out of there later told me that the longer you stay in a coma in that stage, the heavier the well, the heavier the consequences. And if I'd stayed in Omsk for several more hours, I probably never would have given another interview. At best, I would have sat up and they'd push me around in a wheelchair. Why did you want a German hospital specifically? Nobody wanted a German hospital. They just knew that they had to get me out of Omsk. And for one, like Om. Omsk healthcare is known for its inadequacy, even by Russian standards. But most importantly, uh, everyone realized I was poisoned here is that I was on death's door and needed urgent poisoning treatment. And then I guess these guys come out and go, he had too much moonshine. You going to leave me with these doctors here? So you don't believe in the Hippocratic Oath? Mm. What do you mean, don't believe? Here's my understanding. Look, I may be naive, but um, I've seen situations where I've never been in a foreign hospital. But in Russia, despite our messed up healthcare system, still has many talented doctors. And by some miracle, some of them work in free clinics. They yeah. too treat, they save lives and do their job well. I thought that when a doctor faces a choice to either honor the Hippocratic Oath or follow the orders of some suit, they'll either think about or automatically chooses the oath. Uh, Am I too naive about that? No, you're not too naive. Uh, There were a lot of amazing people, even in this Omsk hospital, among the low-level staff. But their head physician is not a doctor. He's a member of United Russia. What? He's going to tell his doctors to either not treat you or treat you incorrectly? Listen, uh, he came out and said that the official diagnosis was metabolic disorder. A guy drops down on a plane and falls into a coma, and they go, this is not poisoning. We did 60 tests. There's no sign of poisoning. Besides, doctors who would come up to me and then would say, get him out of here. You know why they poisoned me outside of Moscow? Because they knew that, for one, there's a lot of 
great doctors in Moscow, and two, they're supervised. So maybe not as effectively as their colleagues in Berlin, right? But Moscow doctors would likely catch me alive, whereas if I had stayed in Omsk, I would have died and ended up in an Omsk morgue. So you think that they would have tested on me anything? The Omsk morgue would have reported, the man is dead, what a suspicious death, everyone would have said. Yuri Dut would have probably released a documentary six months later saying the man we lost, right? Um, the people would be... I love our reputation. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, hopefully, you would have at least made something like that, right? Um, people would have carried my pictures at rallies, and many would have said, we don't believe in his sudden death at 44 years old. And Vladimir Solovyov would come out and say, it's all that like Kaftanchikov of Mashiach, and just any kind of super lie. And they just say that he was an addict and stuff like that. No one would have done any sort of testing here. And you wouldn't have found out it either, which is another thing about chemical weapons, you know what I mean? They dissolve in the body really fast. Did you have any moonshine in Kaftanchikov? No, I've never had any moonshine in the country. Not even a single shot. No. I took a dip in the river and went back. One, one, one of the reasons they went to get me out of there were, were the absurd lies that people, that people started throwing around immediately. This imaginary moonshine and other stuff like that. I had people with me. And some of our men stayed in Tomsk. Others flew with me and saw some things that they unraveled. And imagine seeing things as they're going down there and then hearing ridiculous lies about what happened. They knew that they had to get me out of there as fast as possible and wanted to keep me there for as, as uh, well, so they needed to get me out. And then everyone else wanted them for as long as possible. So they called a bunch of doctors and they all said to fly me out of there and that there's no such thing as non-transportable patients because a medical airplane is like a premium flying hospital that easily beats an Omsk hospital. But these guys would come out and lie, he's non-transportable. And what can you do about it? That's, uh, that's why I'm so grateful to my wife and everybody who basically fought for me. They didn't have any real power here. They... So there was nothing they could do. They couldn't just storm the hospital and steal me, could they, right? You know, but, but they, started, they started a ruckus and somehow made the authorities release me. Yulia, what do you think allowed you to get him out of there, basically, and to bring him to Germany? I remember this moment perfectly. It seems so cinematic to me on the second day when... Many people were probably watching, and it became clear that most likely they wouldn't let him go. I went to meet with the German doctors after they didn't let me into the hospital. We found out where they stayed, called them, and I came to them. We talked with them in this hotel, and... Um, and they said that uh, they would write, they told me that this is absolutely transportable and that they are ready to take him out. And uh, that they will write me a document, uh, but it will take some time, about an hour. Then I left the hotel. On one side, there was a river, a wooden flooring uh, where I sat down. And on the other side, there was a wedding. And there was such a celebration People were singing some songs. Um, Shouting cheers? Yeah. Uh, they didn't shout cheers, but everyone was uh, beautifully dressed and decorated. And it was like, at that moment, I realized that something, sur something surreal was happening. It was all so strange. Probably at that moment, I thought that I... I didn't think that I wouldn't be able to take him. I thought that probably today I won't be able to take him. I think there were a lot of efforts for many people. And probably it was the pressure from my side and the pressure uh, in the press, on the Internet. We wanted to take him and uh, they wouldn't give him to us. At uh, the international level, I think Merkel uh, and Macron made some statements, but honestly, I didn't follow this much. There was also my letter demanding his release to Putin. I think it was some, uh, all these efforts came together, and at some point they realized that it would be easier to release him than to stage such a show. It's a bad word, but a show in a sense that they would let him die on live TV, however scary it may sound now. After the story, I learned to say the word death and dying, because in my family, when 
Lex say, uh, or the kids say something like that, I will scold them terribly in it. Don't like to pronounce these words. Um, now, um, now somehow it became easier for me to do it because I understood that he would probably die there. Your team later collected evidence from your hotel room. Yeah. They realized they needed to get inside your room at least Mm, three hours after you checked out. With the road to no, the airport. Sooner, much sooner. Oh, hold on, hold on. With the road well, to the airport. You checked out from where? Uh, the hotel after you left it. Why hadn't the staff cleaned the room yet? Because it was early morning. I left the hotel at six, and they received the news that we'd landed in Omsk because Navalny had been poisoned very early in the morning, too, at, uh, at breakfast. They, they were having breakfast. The uh-huh. room hadn't been cleaned yet. I see, around nine local time. Yeah, again, uh, and well, I mean, you have to remember the context of our everyday life. The first question they ask me in every interview is, how are you still alive? And we discuss the scenario where I get assassinated all the time at the ACF, you know what I mean? And we mostly do it jokingly, but still. But still, they simply did what they were prepared to do for way in advance. And they told them Navalny was poisoned. They said, well, let's check out his room to see what he ate and drank. And they went to the room. The staff wouldn't let them in. And they set up a watch to stop anyone from entering. And eventually they convinced the manager, got inside and picked up these bottles and whatever else. And thinking back, no one would have believed that this was going to happen. Had someone come up to me prior or even that day and said that Novichok chemical weapons, I would have just laughed in their face. But in hindsight, they should have taken samples of wallpaper and swabbed everything in the room to collect more evidence. I think, but they entered the room, they checked out the mini bar, saw the open bottles, and they took them. They weren't collecting evidence per se. They just picked up the most obvious things. One of the collectors was Maria Pevci. Who is she? Head of the investigations department has been for years. Many journalists know her. Why didn't anyone except for those many journalists know about her? No, prior? it's just not true that nobody knew about her. All investigative journalists in Russia really knew her. She's been working with the ACF for many years. She just decided a while ago that she wanted to stay out of the public eye, which is why so many people know Giorgi Albura from investigations. He has a Twitter X account. A lot of people know him. In Pivchik was never a secret employee at all. All investigative journalists have known her for years. Some articles said that Pevchik and you stayed in the same hotel room. Is that true? Uh, well, obviously not. Moreover, we have a special protocol. No one ever enters my room. For example, she, uh, she was responsible for a shoot and had one of my shirts, and I needed to, to get it from her. And she messaged me, we met in the hallway, and she gave me the shirt. The protocol says, females never enter my hotel room or anything like that, because we all know that they could record it, and then they could just go, a woman enters his room there, and three hours later, the now disheveled figure sneaks out. You know what I mean? So it's it's obviously made up and completely unrealistic, and otherwise they would have already released videos of women or even men entering my room, and it's not true. But nobody ever did. One thing I found odd about the transportation of evidence, when asked where the evidence were transported, she said it was strategically stowed in different bags. Some was in carry-ons, the rest in luggage. But remember when the scripples were poisoned? There was a woman called Don Sturgis yes, and, her, she and her friend. They touched this perfume bottle, I think. Her friend was in critical condition and Don herself died. He gave her the bottle and she thought that it was perfume, sprayed it on herself and died. I'm trying to get how do you carry on board something that could kill everyone on the plane, literally. Again, so let's rewind. At the time, nobody knew about Navichok or that this was evidence. They examined the room and took the bottles because the initial assumption was they, they got a message and Navalny was poisoned. They went to my room to find whatever I ate or drank. Maybe there was a cyanide in my water, right? And just e- even knowing how insane our authorities are, the idea that they'd use lethal chemical weapons within Russia was was still pretty extreme. It just didn't make sense. At the time, no one thought of this as, as evidence. And when the team and my wife 
wash my clothes into these bottles there, their idea was that they should help the doctors figure out what they're treating so they would know what to do. And the guy passed out, so what are we treating? But they... So just, but they knew it was poisoning, didn't they? What, what, what kind of poisoning? The basic uh, metabolic panel returns nothing. That's the whole point of chemical weapons. To know what you're treating, you you want to first figure out what the poison is. And that's why they, uh, they, well, they didn't hand the bottles over to local security agencies or anything like that, because they handed everything over to the people at the hospital, and they never treated it as evidence. And our investigation department guys, including Pevchik, had no doubt in their minds that I'd have been poisoned, most likely at the hotel, probably, and there would be a cover-up operation to make it to make everything look as inconspicuous as as possible. So just in case, they stowed these items around and tried to fly them out in a way to avoid confiscation. That was it. But no one gave it much thought at the time. It was much more of a formality. Uh, I mean, I mean, seriously. It seemed highly improbable that someone had come into the room and poured poisonous powder in, uh, in one of the bottles. But they just took them just in case. Have you read the report that Maria Pevchik's father is connected to a chem lab? I have. I've read a lot of theories. They're all laughable. This theory is as dumb as but, the one with Kaplan. Is he connected or not? Well, as I understand, no. It's all made up. He has a connection to some kind of business, but it has nothing to do with chemistry at all. You know what I mean? Have you had any doubts creep in? No, I don't suspect anything. I mean, again, after I'd come back and regained my cognitive abilities, when they first mentioned in the Vichok, be, be, being sad of sound of mind by then, I said, are you high? It can be the Vichok. They told me that three labs in three different countries had said that it was Novichok, a chemical weapon. It took me a while, but I processed and accepted it. A regular chemist doesn't have access to this type of weapon. Putin said something silly to Macron if the media is to be believed that I'd cooked some Novichok and poisoned it myself. I did it to myself. You believe he could have said that? Well, the fact that the French press covered this with a fair bit of detail and that the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs then said that they were investigating the leak, I, I really doubt that it was a leak, though, is proof that this was no accident. Did they well, leak yeah, it? they leaked it themselves and launched an investigation. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Well, it looks that way. Oh. I mean, I think that they were just outraged by the audacity of Putin's lies. Because when you're a president, you sort of expect a certain level of respect. I mean, I guess that they expected him to say something like, well, we had an in-house issue. We'll just, and we'll just take care of it ourselves. Uh, we can't share all of the details, but we'll handle it. So please don't worry. Instead, he goes, Navalny's faking it. He probably poisoned himself. And any, anyone would get annoyed. A, a lie of such order is annoying. Your daughter, Dasha, is pretty much a grown-up, but your son, Zahar, is about to hit his teens. Um, do you ever have difficult conversations about his dad's work? It's a funny story. Uh, it's probably not flattering for Zahar, but it, it speaks volumes about our lie. Dasha learned about the poisoning. Yulia rushed to the airport. The, Dasha told me that she went to Zakhar's room. Zakhar was playing, uh, he was playing GTA 5, GTA Online. And she says, Dad got poisoned. He goes, mm hmm, and keeps playing. She says, He got poisoned. He's in a coma. And he goes, Yeah, combos are bad. And he keeps playing GTA Online. Well, not like that. He said, Whoa, and he kept oh, yeah, on yeah, playing. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just have to understand that they watch my interviews as well, you know? And in every interview, they hear questions like, Are, are you afraid of assassination? How are you still alive? This stupid background of uh, killed, not killed, will get killed or not, it's permeated everything so. So thoroughly that there were some terrible moments, but I missed all of them. The best part about this whole story for me is, is there is a best part, is hearing the anxious jokes that they told each other during these events. Like, like when they brought me in this box to the airplane, like, what did they, what did they say? Oh, in a private jet, Finally, yeah. Alexei. Finally, a private jet, yeah. Private so, uh, Alexei, you've investigated so many private jet owners, and you're finally flying by one yourself. So, there was a box that says biohazard, or you said, uh, Shubala flies his corgis in a jet, and I'm flying my husband in a box. Stuff like that, you know? Uh, <laughs> it was like that. So, Alexei was in a box, right? I mean, it's some uh, kind of... 
oxygen cocoon? Yes, it was like an oxygen cocoon, yes. Uh -huh. Just some kind of box uh, with uh, air inside. Well, there was this other thing about being poisoned, so there had to be some sort of isolation. That's why it was in a box with the inscription biological threat in this biohazard symbol. I'm sorry for the detail, but were you just next to his cocoon? Or is it isolated from the cabin? No, this cocoon itself is already isolated, so you uh, don't need to sit far away from it. Not exactly uh, like we are standing honestly, now. Honestly, it's like a coffin. So sitting on the couch that's next to... why I apologize before. I prefer before. not yeah. to sit. Well, come on, it's okay. Everyone is alive now, everyone's fine. Well, for me, it's uh, easier than for anyone else. Some federal TV stations suggested the idea that it could have been someone on your team. Why do you exclude this possibility? Well, I'm not negating it. It's just that theoretically, yeah. theoretically, uh, in theory, you could have been recruited by the FSB. You got me to do this interview. And there's never a choke in this bottle. And if I die now, then it's on you. So in theory, you can't really exclude the possibility that the, the bad guys had recruited somebody by holding their family hostage and said, here's a Band-Aid for you. You need to... Stick it to Navalny's shirt for 10 seconds, and then take it off wearing gloves, and you're free to go. So is this possible in theory? It is, of course. Is it possible in practice? No, I negate that. Why? Well, because I've worked with these people for many years, really. Besides, we know how political assassinations in Russia work. Those stories on, on the federal channels are, are typical examples of turning the spotlight away from the heart of the problem. Mm. Like when Nimtsov shot himself, you know? No, I but do understand that. What I mean is, family. hold so, on, but what about you? You have security measures, right? There are a lot of people at the ACF. How often do you suspect that someone on the team could be, you know... Well, never. Moreover, one key feature of this, of this method that they used is that they only well-trained professionals can utilize Nevichok or similar weapons. You can't grab just anyone and go. Like, you just can't take anyone and say, hey, here's the bottle with this, with this stuff, right? And just go. They'll probably poison and kill themselves instantly, which is why... Which is why assassins that use chemical weapons are well-trained professionals, which serves as indirect proof that the attempt was sanctioned by the Kremlin. It couldn't have been simply out of control in our oligarch, right, or corrupt official because of this combination, you know what I mean? Because Nevichok, Nevichok plus people with access and skills to handle it, which, which is like, like five people in the Foreign Intelligence Service and five people in the FSB. Your opinion. Who's behind it? My opinion is that it was done by either the FSB or the FIS agents, obviously on Putin's orders. Because I... Okay, fine. Let's break it down to you, right? Uh, can you buy Nebichok at a supermarket? No. Can you cook it at a chem lab? No. It's a binary chemical weapon. It's impossible to make it. Some shadowy genius couldn't have made some. No, you need a pretty complex chem lab for this. Besides, you, you need the skills to be able to use it. So consider all of the components here. First, uh, Novichok itself. Second, the events in Omsk, where the uh, Minister of Healthcare put together a group. The group that, like, why did the Minister of Healthcare or their head physicians care? So you really think that they wanted to stay and die in their hospital? Of course they didn't. They put together a group that flies over from Moscow to confirm that I'm not transportable. This whole chain of, uh, then you have Putin's outrageous, private, personal lie that I faked it and poisoned myself. Uh, so, you know what I mean? The, the combination of these facts paints this picture. So we don't have footage of Putin kicking and screaming, kill him, he, he offends my united Russia and talks about my money. We don't have that footage, but... But, but two people could have, uh, the d director of the SBSB Bortnikov and director of FIS Narishkin can write a, a letter that goes, take requisite measures and make love potion number nine. But, but the only person that can order them to use the love potion number nine on a Russian citizen is, uh, of course, none other than Putin himself. Man, Alexei, even with the with the with, with the impact, the megalomania, with the you took the word out of my mouth. Even with the huge impact of your and ACF's investigation, 
Don't you think you sound a little megalomaniacal? No, I don't. What did you do specifically to Putin to make him lose his cool and order such a clumsy attempt on your life? First off, not clumsy. So continuing from earlier, it wasn't clumsy. It was pretty clever. They calculated exactly that I'd be on a plane unable to get any medical help for hours, so they calculated it pretty well. You know what I mean? A few random elements intervened, though. Besides, if they had sh- if they had shot or dropped a brick on my head or hit me with a car or used some other widely accessible murder weapon, then there could have been many options. But the AECF investigated a lot of people. We've upset, offended, insulted, and exposed a lot of people. I think that a lot of people want me dead, and a ton of officials use my portrait on their walls as a dartboard, shouting, like, like, why don't you die? This weapon of choice is a clear indicator, really. An FSB lieutenant general or some random offended guy can't just call somebody up, uh, get some novichok, hire a team of assassins that know how to use it, and set something like this in motion. So where are the videos from my hotel? Why is there no investigation? Why did the doctors in Omsk act so weird and wouldn't release me? Well, look. So let me finish. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, They used a lot of different resources to do this. So there's no megalomania. I just know that there's no other pathway within our system. Why not? Assume this was done without Putin's involvement. Well, uh, well, tell me your version. Do you believe in the concept of the Kremlin Towers, that famous one? No. The Kremlin Towers. No, it's not real. I mean, that there are different people in the Kremlin that fight for resources and try to steal the mo. But there are no towers. But there are clans, right? There are people who are friends with one another and not others. Yes. So there are several decision-making centers and stuff. Well, yeah. Assume one of them uh, wants to, you either got to them, or maybe they associate you with another clan that you don't bother as much or presumably get inside data from. And they want to hurt this clan by removing you. Meaning, none of this involves Putin. He's somewhere up here, and these clans duke it out down here. And without informing the boss, as they call him, uh, they run this operation, basically. And they botch it. Once the news gets out, their boss tries to play it down somehow. You well, know? everything about your theory is fine, except for the murder weapon. It's impossible to obtain. Well, well you see, again, so you can hire an assassin to shoot What do you mean impossible? You could. The law says, I mean, are you saying that there is no person that could use Novichok without the president knowing? Is that what you mean? I want to say that you can't do this without the director of either FSB or FIS knowing. Russian law says you cannot carry firearms on you. You know how many people actually possess because firearms? Because you know where to and buy and how to it, use it. You can't buy Novichok. That's the thing. That's what it is. You don't believe that there's a dozen ninjas out there that know how to use it and are state agents? Well, it's not about believing or assuming. It's about knowing how the world works. We have one confirmed case of assassination using an older version of Novichok in Russia. And one of its creators sold an ampule of it to the assassins for 4,000 euros, if I remember correctly. And so you you can't just... This happened many years ago. And there's no black market for this thing at all. Besides, it's now been proven that it's some new modification. It's not a... It's not a normal poison. It's not something you can just buy. That's why it turned... It it turned into an international scandal. Everyone understands, chemists and experts understand too, that it's not something that a regular person, even with power, can obtain. Uh, Only a small number of people have access to the substance and and the agents that can use it, really. And so... Say someone tells the FSB or the SFR, uh, says, kill this one, and they'll go, sure thing, we'll do it, but we need an official order. So we will cook the love potion number nine and we'll kill him, but we need appropriate uh, appropriate what? paperwork from you. What paperwork? It's like uh, 
the, the, the receipt. Uh, I get that modern intelligence carries around receipts for for yeah, 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 cab yeah. rides to the airport. Yes, I get it. Well, not everyone works like Bashirov and Petrov. Well, of course. Well, this is all in the theoretical domain. But there's indirect evidence that I that I analyze and use to come to rational conclusions. So you ask what I believed. You actually believe that Putin straight up I, I don't gave see the any order? other explanation. So when I ask you why, I have an answer to that. The last two years, our system has been under unprecedented amounts of pressure. You know about the police raids. Everyone on the team has frozen bank accounts. They interrogate everyone. Uh, the pressure keeps growing exponentially. And I have to pay a million to Prigozhin, Putin's cook. Sobol has to pay one million. The ASB has to pay tens of millions of rubles. And so we have to switch organizations. Despite all of this, we didn't just survive. We got stronger. We smacked United Russia pretty heavily at the recent vote. And so coming into the Duma election, they knew that they were in big trouble. So I think that, again, this is just my theory, you can call it megalomania if you wish, in a sense, we became the victims of our own success. We survived their onslaught. Moreover, we turned every bit of their pressure into new victories. So they come in and take everything and we go, you guys help us replace our stuff and end up getting even more donations. And they don't register us for elections. We use the smart voting and other political parties to beat down United Russia. And so just look at Tomsk. We took their majority from them. Don't underestimate it. Additional context, Khabarovsk. Belarus, and everything. So so Putin is personally concerned about his power and his money. You don't doubt that, do you? The matter of United, of United Russia's survival and the matter of its majority in councils is directly tied to Putin's personal power and money. So obviously it bothers him. Have you considered... Prigozhin by any chance. Listen, I've considered everybody, but again, the weapon of choice really narrows it down substantially. Do you remember the moment when he came to? Uh, On the very first day when we arrived, I told the German doctors, please, when you're bringing him out of coma, well, you know, we've all watched movies where Uh, Someone lives in a ward, uh, opens their eyes, and all the relatives rush to them hugging, and they remember everyone, and uh, not everyone, and the whole movie circumvents around it. But I warned them, please tell me I'll also be in the hospital. They said, yes, yes, okay. And then when it started happening, it became clear that in real life it's completely different. They reduced the dose of the medication that kept him in a coma, and he somehow, uh, he somehow opens his eyes. He opens his eyes and closes them again. It's like he's looking, but maybe he doesn't understand anything. And this lasts for several days. There was no such thing as he woke up and said, good morning, everyone, or smiled. There was no such thing. But I certainly remember the moment when he didn't speak because he had this uh, trachostomy, I think that's how it's called, uh, basically a tube in the neck, so he couldn't speak. There's a special plug that uh, they turn on at a certain moment and you can talk with it, but it wasn't immediate. And uh, I think he couldn't speak for the first few days. And I started showing him the conversations that Lukashenko leaked, the negotiations. Mike uh, yeah, and Yeah, Nick. yeah, yeah, with Poland and Germany. And uh, at some point he started laughing. Oh. And then I realized that probably uh, He's we'll more keep alive on fighting. Than dead. The scariest thing is that the Kremlin, even if you don't believe that it was Putin or not, uh, some high-ranking officials are now using this stuff. And so just let me tell you, yeah, I think it's just that using these sorts of weapons is true madness because you can't detect them. And so by sheer luck, several super labs just took my some of my blood for testing, and they found another choke inside of me. 
on my arm and somewhere else. And they, so, the, so they found it in my body. And the bottle is not the evidence. They found it in my body. If you're in Moscow, just imagine a scenario. We have a presenter with a YouTube channel, a really big one, like a really big one. And everyone's sick of him because he brings over Belarusian oppositionists as well as local ones. And everybody hates him in general because he has a bigger audience than a federal channel. A really unpleasant person for the Kremlin. So one day, this TV presenter leaves his house, gets in his car. A YouTube presenter. A YouTube presenter. It's important. Okay, sure. I don't mean anyone in particular. He opens up his car, starts driving somewhere, and soon starts to feel unwell. Then he gets worse and worse, and he drives off the road, and that's it. And that's it. They take him to the hospital or a morgue. It's no lab that has great, honest doctors, but doesn't have a mass spectrometer, but doesn't have a mass spectrometer because only 18 labs in the world have one, will find anything at all. And everyone will say, he was so young. What an odd death. Vladimir Solodyov will come out and say, have you seen his hair? He was obviously a junkie. Someone else will say, and his friends, that they're rappers. You know those types, you know what I mean? So clear... It's clear as day that they'd get together and shoot up and snort stuff. There's another theory here. So he went for a swim in Kaftanchikova. They say that he and his cameraman stayed in the same hotel room. Maybe someone on his team poisoned him or not. Maybe his wife did it or not. And this, this discussion goes on, but no one will ever find out the answer. Just a suspicious death. That's the scariest part. Again, maybe it's megalomania or not, but everything here indicates that Putin is obsessed with the idea of mysterious poisonings. He loves to think that he commands this Nazgul-type army of these secret uh, ninja and assassin-like dudes that just terrify everyone. So, so say you're brave and you're not afraid of prison or you're not afraid of being shot or killed or getting your leg cut off with a chainsaw. But opening your car door and dying after that, the stuff's almost mystical. They're loving it down there in the Kremlin that they, they terrify people with the idea that someone could just pat you on the back. And it's nice knowing you. They really, they really love it. They see this as a method of influence, and it works too, even here in Germany. Um, I was told that some perfectly reasonable people, not prone to overreacting, have said that these Russians and Putin, man, let's stay the hell away from them. They're insane. Because they're crazy. Using the Vichok on a plane against a Russian citizen? What if it went wrong? Say they put it on my shirt, I spill some juice on it, and and then ask the person next to me to hold it while I change. And they die. And do you know why we haven't used chemical weapons since World War I, even before the ban? Because it's dangerous even to the people using it, and it's not very effective. That's why they don't use it. It's guaranteed to cause a very painful death, but it's not very effective as a warfare tool. But as a means of spreading fear and terror among the masses, it's... It's just perfect. But I think how many people in Russia said, they said after this incident, man, they poisoned Navalny so openly, maybe I better just shut up. So particularly outside of Moscow. Being an oppositionist outside of Moscow is scary. Saying bold things, running a big YouTube channel, maybe some, maybe some of them won't care, or others will think, there's, there's some crazy stuff going on out there and no one's going to find anything. That's their goal. Maybe it wasn't even about killing me at all, you know? Maybe they wanted to scare people into submission, because as far as I can tell, they more or less succeeded. About Alexei's appearance after the coma. Mm -hmm. Well, in general, the film critic turned film director Volobuyev said it best in his tweet. After his coma, Navalny looks better than I ever have. Why do some get everything and others everything else? Uh, do you agree with Volobuyev? 
Well, they can change, especially if he's envious. Uh, first of all, yeah, we could switch. Second, Volobyov hasn't seen my physiotherapy. You know how they show, like, 90-year-old grannies in parks wearing those things? Like, I, I sit on an exercise ball trying to hold my balance with one foot, and I may have lost a little bit of weight, but if you ask me to pick something up, you're in for a little bit of a show. So Volobyov definitely shouldn't envy me. Uh, uh, hold on, dude. but you were trying to lose weight, weren't you? I mean, you got into jogging and mm, all that stuff. Uh, well, funny thing about jogging, uh, they told me that one of the happy coincidences that kept me alive was that I was in good shape physically. You, you know that I jogged, right? For the last two years, I tried to jog thrice a week, and I hate jogging. I thought that I'd warm up to it, and I jogged, and I hated every step that I took. Now that I'm thinking that this must be some sort of karma compensation for my suffering, you know? Did that actually help? Well, let's admit, you swam besides running. Well, jogging, swimming, uh, no. They said that it definitely helped that I was in such good physical shape. Because after, because after 40, everyone is prone to gain weight, you know? Uh-huh. And I just try not to. So rather than losing weight, it's just about not getting extra. Okay. When did Angela Merkel come to visit you? Uh, well, this was during my last week in the hospital, in a regular hospital room post-ER. Did she come to your ward? Yeah, the door opened and my doctor came in and said, you have a guest, they're just for you. Hey, you didn't know prior. I wasn't. Oh, come on. No, seriously. So the FPS didn't know Nothing your like room. that. No canine checks. Seriously. Uh, before we started, like, this interview, you know? Before we started this interview, uh, first, you came here with guards. Yes. Uh, second, uh, 90 minutes before we started recording, local FSO or whatever inspected the place. The Berlin police. Berlin police searched the place and, and stuff. They found my stash of socks and... Uh, you wanted to arrest you for that? Uh... <laughs> It was a possibility. Uh, they even took pictures of our passports. So they guard Merkel worse than you? Well, there was security outside of my room, and they probably figured that the people in the room, like my wife and I and my child, didn't pose any threat to Angela Merkel. Things are different here a little bit. The politicians don't drive around with beacons. Angela Merkel lives in a regular building, and there's police posted outside of it. They don't block off any roads for them. Uh, things are totally different here. So a funny story about security... When I started to understand things again, before I started to understand things, I noticed that there was a little room behind a glass window uh, next to the ER, and there was a guy in this room who didn't look like a doctor at all. But there was always somebody there. It seemed odd, but not my first priority. I had all kinds of hallucinations. I was coming out of a coma. You know what I mean? Uh, some guy, like, no problem. He was part of my fantasy world. When I started to understand things again, I got a visit from a group of very nice folks. They said, hi, we're the leadership of the Berlin police. Are you aware that somebody tried to kill you with a very dangerous weapon? I said, well, I'm surprised, but I'm aware of it. Do you think that they could they could repeat their attempt on you here in Berlin? I said, I doubt it, but I can't be certain. And they said, well, since you're not certain... Um, some very odd and unusual things happen around you. And we don't want you to get hit by a car or killed with a falling brick in Germany. And our taxpayers will get really upset if something bad happens to you, particularly if they were, they were really diplomatic. So what they actually meant was, you, you Russian crazies run around poisoning each other with chemical weapons, while we don't want any chemical weapons inside of Germany. The point is, it's not me they're protecting, but the, the people around me because of, well, uh, well, because of what happened. They prefer to have some people follow me than to risk things going awry, for them to go wrong. What did Angela Merkel say? Uh, why did she visit you? It was a private conversation. We didn't discuss anything sensational. When she came in, my first thought was, well, we're in a hospital. I mean, what her patients were, right? I thought, man, good thing I'm wearing something. <laughs> she, she said, like, oh, well, we talked. And again, it was a very private conversation without delving into any details. Nothing of importance came up, really. It wasn't a political conversation. I was just surprised by how detailed her understanding of current events in Russia was. So, I mean, normally you meet a foreign politician and go, let me tell you what's really going on in Russia. Because they live in an ivory tower. 
But she knew current Russian events better than anyone, down to every detail about Khabarovsk, about Belarus, down to every detail with full context, knows how things work. And in Russian, too. Merkel walked in and started to talk in Russian, and it honestly caught me like... How well, though? Did she say, We switched to English, but I felt that she could have had a conversation with me in Russian the whole way through. Whoa. Yeah. Like, talking to this person, you realize why they're one of the European leaders. She's a very... She's a she's a really smart and forward-thinking woman, but it was just a really private conversation. We didn't discuss anything momentous. Were you flattered by her visit? Well, it was a pleasant surprise, certainly. Did it bother you? No. That propaganda could now go... Um, that's it. Navalny's master Otto visits him in the hospital. Putin meets with Angela Merkel, doesn't he? Well, and, I mean, he's the president. they're on the same level. They, they're they equals. Our minister of foreign affairs meets with her, doesn't he? Uh, even mid-level officials meet with her at summits and things like that. I just don't mean it like I'm the second politician in the country, but I'm probably one of, one of the key figures of Russian political opposition. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with me meeting with a foreign leader to discuss Russian or international affairs. I can discuss them as well as Putin can. I don't see any problem with that at all. Question about Dasha Navalny. Did she tell you that she wanted to go to college in the U.S., or was it your idea? I think the beginning initially, Alexei always said, what difference does this school make? And at some point, I pulled him into this Moscow circle of parents uh, uh, who are always looking for a better school. So we were always striving to find something better. Some so even we, moved closer to those schools, I heard. Well, it didn't, it didn't come yeah, didn't to that, it, but really. we ended up becoming such parents. So we are obsessed with education. It always seems to us that our children don't visit enough school circles, poor children. So we wanted a better education for our child. We knew that she uh, knew English well, she was preparing for it. It was very difficult, but it wasn't about whether she should go uh, somewhere to study or stay and study in Russia. We wanted the education she would get to be great. I, I swayed between the two extremes, really, from who cares what school you go to, I guess, because I grew up in a closed little town that only had one school, and I couldn't wrap my head around the idea of choosing a school all the way to being somewhat obsessed with education. So it's not like we told her to pick an American or German or Russian college. We said, here are the top universities. We, as a family, would like you to get into one of the ones at the top. The higher oh, I the guess. So was it that level? Well, yeah. Of, I mean, so we uh, want you to get a good... We, well, I mean, we, we want you to have a good education. So let's get you prepped in the next two years, get you... Uh, get you some tutors and classes, and the higher you can get on the list, the better. She applied to several universities and ended up getting into one of the best. If this university had been located in Hong Kong or Tarzok or, or Tomsk, she would be studying in Tomsk today. But, oh well, unfortunately, Russia is pretty low on the list. You only pay for her dorm, right? Yes, dorm and food. Which is about two thousand dollars a month. Twenty-two thousand dollars a year, I think. I think twenty-two yeah. or twenty-four thousand. No, a bit less. Twenty-two, twenty thousand. Uh, why is tuition itself free? Because then your family income is. Well, you send them all like bank statements, and if your family's annual income is less than a hundred sixty thousand dollars a year, I believe. Yeah, yeah, around that. Then. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, well, then Stanford pays for your tuition. This applies to everyone. But only if you ace your entry. If you exams. got admitted. So, and can you apply remotely? Well, no, you there take are tests. No you, you write an essay and you take tests. Well, not ah. tests. You write essays and, and then all of that. N- no, not tests. You write an essay and take. Um, to make it clearer for you, it's something like TOEFL, SAT, for instance, but it's a unified state exam for all subjects. Well, they're all international universities, right? So they have lots of foreign students. And today, it wouldn't be entirely correct to call like Stanford or Harvard or Yale strictly American universities because they're international universities. So same with the ones with the, with the better Chinese universities. So no longer Chinese, they're international ones. And if you get into them, they win from 
having you as their student because you're smart, you came over, and that's great. So uh, if you get in and you prove that your family can't afford to pay $70,000 a year, then they go, okay, sponsors, endowment, and you, university alumni will cover your fees, and you just pay for the dorm. How much did the medevac from Omsk to Berlin cost? I believe it was 75,000 euros. Boris Seaman paid for it, for which I'm really grateful. How much did your treatment at Charlite cost? Uh, they haven't given us the final bill yet because I, I'm still working with a physical therapist, but based on the figures that we've been seeing so far, uh, then it'll be around sixty to $70,000. Uh, how does this work in practice? They hand you the final bill after, or is there well, a special we got, we account? Got, we got bills along the way, so it's actually super transparent. Because, for example, a local deputy came out and said, excuse me, why are German taxpayers footing a Russian patient's medical bills uh, once again? So their taxpayers are not footing my bills. It's certainly a huge sum for me. Uh, I don't have the 70,000 euros to pay for my treatment, but there's a number of people who told me the following. Thank you so much, but you can't stay anonymous. For example, Zeman paid for the flight. I can openly say that the 75,000 euros for the medevac came from Boris Zeman, and he can confirm it. Similarly, everyone who chips in to pay for the treatment will reveal their names. You recently revealed your yearly income for 2019. Your income was the number will appear up here. Uh, the bulk of this amount came from uh, legal work for uh, Boris Zimmet. Yes. What kind of legal work are we talking about? Most of it is organization. Uh, organization of coordinated work with ESHR for a number of people. But again, for the purpose of full um, uh, disclosure, Zimmet knows perfectly well that uh, I have bills to pay. He also knows that politics is my main job and focus of efforts. He signs, so he signs a binding contract with me. I do certain work agreed upon in the contract, but it's not exactly a super strict client-provider uh, relationship. Um, it's so it's more like a sponsorship. It's not more like a sponsorship, but he certainly doesn't desperately need my services, for example, especially since he buys them for third parties, not himself. But, but his main motive is the desire to help us. It is the obvious truth. I'm not going to sit here to pretend like it's not. But uh, these services, however minor, are you the one providing them? I yeah, mean, do yeah, you shuffle docs yeah, in your yeah. computer or does the ACF staff mm, do it? Well, I do it too, of course. I regularly go to Strasbourg. Is it a good thing for a politician? It is, I mean, yes, yes. when you have someone who basically publicly sponsors you, I mean, your personal and family expenses are covered by someone who lives abroad and is, well, fairly obvious opponent of the current regime. Well, first, he's a Russian citizen, and that's key to me. So second, it is a good thing. You know about this, right? Everyone does. Meaning everyone who wants to know knows where Navalny and his family get their money from. Can you say the same about Putin or Zolotov? You don't even know for certain what Putin's daughter's names are, an official confirmation of this or what they do. It's never been said officially, you know? That's uh, unacceptable. Here you have a specific person who is a Russian citizen. Everyone knows how much they pay me, and I get all of the money legally. I pay my taxes, I pay my bills with it, and the money that I get corresponds exactly with my lifestyle. The numbers match. It just the numbers match, and everyone knows how it works. It's transparent, and I make this transparent for everyone. Whereas when your income is 2 million rubles, but you own a 300 million house and an $8 billion car, well, that's an issue. It's a big issue. Are you somehow indebted to Boris Zimin for it? I'm really grateful for his help. He hired the plane, paid 70,000 euros, a huge sum, but he didn't have to. If he if he didn't, then even storming the hospital in Omsk wouldn't have done jack. I don't have to do anything for him, like special investigations or something like that. We have a crystal clear understanding on this. He knows nothing about our current projects. I love chatting with him. He visited me in the hospital as well. And he's, uh, he's a very smart and interesting person, but it's not the type of relationship where he knows more about ACF's work than you do. He just like you sometimes checks YouTube and sees that we posted a new investigation. Okay, what if one day he asks you about something? 
I don't know. For example, um, Alexei, please don't say a word about Khabarovsk rallies. Uh, well, if, Not a well, word. If I believed that something like this could happen, that I would have never taken a penny from him at all. But if something like this does happen... Something happens to him. Well, he He's not perfect, himself. He knows perfectly well that I will say sorry, but no. They blocked your son's card uh, with his laptop fund when he didn't come up to you and go like, Dad. Well, I mean, no, he did come up to, uh, to us and knowing the whole situation that everyone's accounts have been blocked. He said, OK, let's see how much cash I have. I, I'm resetting the and fund. He had an he says, no more <laughs> cards, though, please. Only cash. OK, but what does your everyday life look like when your bank account says negative 70 million? I currently have a minus five million dollars on my card. Why? Because all my accounts are also blocked and I had several accounts, so they put this notorious rest on each one. Was it 99 uh, million? Oh, 75 million or something. Well, the amount is around a million. And since uh, there were several accounts, they just put it on each one. And when I last asked for minus the 70, statement, minus 70. Uh, they gave me minus it's five concerning. million the, dollars. Concerning Stanford. So, uh, yes, it was the card for Stanford. We need to prove that our annual income is, l- is less than X, right? We got our statements. And we also sent a cover letter because we were sending paperwork to the university that said that we had minus several million dollars each. And they might have thought that we were trying to lie to them or just joking. So we sent a cover letter explaining how this is even possible. Does it weigh on you? You know. (laughs) I'm sorry, how can it not weigh on you? I don't know. Well, I like what Alexei is doing. No, no, no. I got it. I got it. I, There's I just, chemistry between you. I mean, being millions I, in the negative. Well, the chemistry, you know, it's more about the fact that you perfectly realize the costs of all of this. And it just turns out that, way you can't do anything about it. We can't do anything now. Even if, as you say, Alexei says, you know, my deadline is up tomorrow. I'm not doing politics anymore. Uh, please lift all the arrests. They won't lift them anyway, so it shouldn't weigh on you. They want it to weigh on us. Well, besides, it's all relative. Um, well, negative, uh, 75 million is unpleasant. Even before this whole coma situation, we didn't really know how it was. But the brilliant green incident, the constant surveillance on her in Dasha, like, uh, well, I mean, you know, that the money situation it is upsetting, seriously, because not having a bank account in the modern world is tough. But it's still really nothing compared to other things happening. During the you know? protests in 2011, they were even following me to school. I mean, in the morning, no, they didn't follow me in the morning, apparently. It was too early when I was coming back from school. They always followed me, and I was terribly annoyed, thinking, oh my God, they are coming anyway. They could just pick up Dasha and bring her to me, but... I I mean, uh, well, uh, it's all relative. Soon after our 2017 interview, they threw brilliant green in your face, and your eyes was in really bad shape. You didn't have a foreign passport back then, uh, but you had to go abroad to treat your eyes, so they issued one. I could only get the right type of surgery abroad, so they didn't do it here in Russia. They issued a passport for you? Yes. Why do you think they did it? So because for years they had been denying me one illegally, and I even don't have an ESHR yes. ruling. Then they suddenly changed their mind. Uh, Why do you think they did? Because it? they had organized the attack, realized that they overdid it, and saw the uproar after. And I wrote a letter to the commissioner for human rights, Vidotov, and I said, "Issue the passport. I needed to go treat my eyes. Something worked, and I don't, and I don't know how it works." So Putin or whatever felt ashamed for a second, or maybe they thought that, ooh, maybe we went a little bit too far, didn't we? Uh, so, well, now this one I, pirate's going to attract compassion like a magnet. Maybe humanity woke up in them. I don't know. Maybe it was calculated because they, they deemed me looking like a victim seemed too threatening. I don't know how exactly the gears turned, but they did. And they finally compiled with the ruling. Keep in mind that I had a ruling that they said they had to give me a passport. They had to. And so if they don't, I don't get the surgery and I lose the eye. And that's also... Well, even to people who... Also I mean, what? Well, I mean, according to your version, these people can straight up, not as a part of their clan or something, but 
They can just straight up poison someone with some kind of spooky chemical stuff. See, well, n- well now you just sound like someone who believes that, 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 that Putin, the Kremlin, and everyone else are spherical cows, you know? Obviously they're not. Or that Putin thinks about geopolitical matters without knowing about Navalny or whatever, so obviously not. At this very moment, he's looking for a solution to the Habarist protests, so he's concerned with the state Duma problem and beating our smart voting. So same thing here. They know perfectly well that a bad political move will have bad consequences for all of them. Denying me the foreign passport and having me lose an eye would have given me more supporters, because even the people who didn't really like me would have certainly disliked someone losing an eye after a brilliant green attack or getting poisoned. I'm not really sure, because but, um, this is just how it works. They don't want more people motivated by compassion, simple human or political compassion to become supporters, just so that they would be supporting them. They would just hate that. Because the day after the poisoning, people at Khabar Skrelas also shouted, and they shouted, Come on, Alex. But that's when they realized, oh crap, we're giving him like. But they didn't. Uh, they didn't feel bad that I was twitching and convulsing in that Omsk hospital out there. Not even for a second at all. They were thinking, okay, if he lives or dies and gets replaced, he'll become a symbol, and United Russia's ratings will drop even further, and their stupid smart voting will work even better. And that was their reasoning, and it's smart reasoning, really, because they don't want us to evoke more sympathy, because any person, even one thoroughly brainwashed by propaganda, can they can still tell the difference between good and evil. They've been in the hospital. They know how things work. No one really likes the idea of people suddenly just dropping down and dying two hours later. Even people who hate me and fully support Putin, they realize, you know, what the hell, it's it's him today, someone else tomorrow, the day after, they'll just... Well, imagine the spiral's out of control. If you're right and there's some sort of, there's some sort of like tower war, then, it, then it's much worse, much worse. If many different people have access to chemical weapons and teams that know how to kill them with them, then it, this is... Well, this is, you know, really, really bad. Have you two ever had the discussion? that maybe you should stop what you're doing. No. Never? No. Even in the heart of the moment, during, I don't know, yet another search, or because of Zakhar's frozen account with his uh, laptop savings. Uh-huh. I probably have nothing more extensive to answer you, because uh, everyone always wants to hear from me or receive some hint that, yes, I would like to stop. But no, I absolutely support what Alexei is doing. I'm absolutely sincere saying it. Um, it's not a, just a beautiful phrase. And waiting halfway at some point is not good, I think. It's not. What is the secret source of your patience? I don't know. Well, you criticized me for being radical. I wish that you'd heard Yuli talking about politics. You would have realized that I'm no, very modern. No, you shouldn't have said that. Even three years ago, Alexei said that you were um, more radical than him on some matters. Well, in what specific issues am I more radical than well, you are? towards certain people and certain, uh, like, it's... Well, it's hard for me... Uh, for me to not even rebuke, not get Yuli's position, because I chose this path and I'm and I'm following it. But uh, you'll probably discuss this in a bit without me. But but hearing uh, these stories about Omsk, the very idea of having to run around this hospital to get your husband released and and get him out of there, and meeting those united Russians, it would radicalize you because. When you face a police officer, well, they're just a cog in the system, right? But when you're not a politician and you encounter the very darkness opposing your family, it probably radicalizes you emotionally. That's my understanding. 
how would you describe your stance on the um, constitutional amendments vote? I don't recognize it. I never got it. It's very simple. I don't recognize it. It was obviously fabricated beforehand, and I just simply don't recognize it. I I knew they were going to pass it. A lot of people don't recognize it. You can vote against or not vote at all, and I personally didn't. Some of the ASCF members across the country voted against. But overall, I believe the amendments need to be rolled back. So, wait, uh, your stance, as far as I can tell, as I understood it from your debate with Katz and stuff, was uh, vote against if you want to vote. If you don't, don't go, because it's a sham. Don't vote in favor. Like that? Absolutely. Uh, Why did you pick this line? Do you feel that maybe there was this rare moment when even Putin's supporters were floored by the Kremlin's nerve, that they came up with this reset? Do you feel like this was a moment where you could have caused a record protest vote by telling everyone to just uh, go and vote against? I mean, not just your hardcore supporters, all right, but also those who were either undecided or, or didn't support anyone, literally, but thought this was too much. Uh, no, I didn't feel like that. Yes. I, I don't exist in a vacuum, right? We have a team, we have a lot of people here during campaigns. I'm the person going from city to city and talking to crowds. But there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people behind me who also work in between elections and take part in decision-making. So therefore, we gauged the situation and concluded that Putin intentionally didn't hold a referendum because he would have lost it. He would have just lost it, had it been a referendum. I would have been running around stirring everyone to go. That way they would have voted. Uh, What's the difference? The difference is that they voided the turnout. They voided the election procedure. They ran as a vote. They passed the new constitution before the vote even happened. They did everything to curb the very possibility of such a public outburst. You know, like when people came about. Wait a minute, I don't get it. I saw the ballots. They said in favor and against, or yes or no, I don't remember. Well, did you read the text above yes and no? Was it written referendum or anything like that? No, it was just vote. It said all Russian vote. What difference does it make if you tell everyone to go and tick the, the no box, basically. Yeah, and as you tick your no box, some gentleman over there ticks 23 yeses. <laughs> you have to understand this. So not all means of political competition are equally effective. Take elections, the atrocious and lamentable elections in Russia. We actively participate in them, and no politician encourages people to vote more than I do. But this all-Russian vote specifically was so rigged, even by Russian election standards, that you couldn't do the whole, well, you know, let's all go and vote against, and people will see the outcome and come together, which, in my opinion, they confirmed the next day. I think so. Let's go a little westward again. Okay to Belarus. Their protest vote actually did happen. They had their against candidate. No, hold on. Uh, They're exactly the same. I mean, they too had a farce of an election. It was a farce because the head of the Central Election Committee is Lukashenko's buddy. They had different candidates, but the general idea was still in favor or against. In favor of Lukashenko or against him, like in favor of Tikhanovska. They generated a huge turnover and voted for Tikhanovska, got beaten up and told that no, Lukashenko had won which resulted in a new countrywide political MO. How was the Belarusian presidential election different from the constitutional amendments vote? It was different in every single way. So even the procedure, they had a candidate, they had this consolidation, their candidates were in jail. They had early voting too, of as course. I recall. Of course, yeah, they no had the early voting. 30% voted early, correct. So your understanding is a little bit distorted by the fact that it all resulted in the incredible Belarusian miracle of three women. It's a unique situation. It's never, ever happened before. So for 26 years, Lukashenko ran his sham and even did referendums. This never happened before. So now that the Belarusian miracle has happened, we're trying to extrapolate it on Russian events right now. But it did happen. You can't do it here. No, no, I I didn't mean the Belarusian miracle. I meant their example. 
They tried. They tried. What do we do? We won't register you yet again. You immediately go, don't vote. No. Evgeny no. Moisman, whom I give props for many things, regularly tweets stuff like, yes, this is a farce. Or, or piss off. To those who uh, encourage well, to, well, he uses you other words. Bastards. He uses, uses other words. I'm not going to quote him exactly. I mean, I love his quotes, but Stop. there. And they won't register you. You go, don't vote. It's a farce. As the last president of Ukraine said, just stop. First off, we don't say that. They won't let us run. They won't register our party. We came up with the smart voting as a way of participating, but they will not let us. We participate all the time. However, out of all of the elections on this particular constitutional vote, my main idea was to not recognize it in all for a rollback to the vote. We didn't so, recognize it. So why? Well, man, well, well when, then you could also say, okay, Tikhanovsky ran, and what? The People saw that they'd been robbed. People who never even cared about politics so now see it I'm, clear as a day, literally. The people, uh, maybe I'm just glamorizing okay, it. Okay, so I'm Yuri Dirt. You're Alexei Navalny. Now I'm going to say, so what? So everything that you just said, my response is, so what? They saw it. So what? They mobilized. So they what? changed their way of... So what? Look, look, what I mean, they completely changed the way they treat so what? politics. It means that even if they cannot overthrow the dictator now, they'll treat their country's politics differently in the future. Yuri, I think that's the whole point of your smart voting thing. You're training people to vote. You're teaching them this simple relation. Potholes near your house won't get patched if politicians don't get involved. You choose the politicians because cause and effect relationship. You're hammering it with your smart voting, which we'll come back to later, because it's driving me nuts. You've mentioned it so many times. Because nothing else is more important. <laughs> uh, See, you're laughing because you don't understand it. I'll explain it. Uh, anyway, cause and effect. Belarusians realize this. It's a completely different way of life now. Of course. You had the chance to at least try and do the same, but you prefer to stay back. After this, some might think, Duh, Navalny's an agent of the Kremlin, because at a crucial moment, you drew the threat away. Uh, others, I don't know, others might think, Alexei, are you sure your team picks the right strategies in your headquarters? Uh, you're totally right. People who sit there and say, so what, are the vilest people in the world. Those who perpetuate this narrative, forget Belarus, take Khabarovsk. Technically, these people haven't achieved anything yet. 80 days, 80 days of rallies. This is unprecedented. No Fergal, no nothing. Jagatariev's still there, but the Far East in the Hawar's cry will never be the same. It's an amazing case. It's truly fantastic. Uh, different things. It wasn't directly caused by the constitutional vote here, but it's just that who could have predicted that an arrested governor could really lead to this? I don't claim that all my decisions are correct for this. Moreover, my game plan is typically based on my, uh, my, uh, my moral stance, if you will. I look at these amendments and I don't recognize them as a citizen and a lawyer, you know, because maybe there were slicker tactics and strategies out there. Looking at history, in terms of political strategy, we could have also said, Hey, so let's do what Chile did. They held a referendum in Chile. People went and overthrew Pinochet. A million tiny differences with both Chile and Belarus. This was the strategy we chose at the time. And maybe we were wrong. And had I encouraged people to vote against it, it would have inspired something. But I don't think so. Ah, did you at any point say I was wrong? Look, I've made a million mistakes. I make 30 mistakes a day like any other human being. I don't have a problem admitting my mistakes. But uh, every decision we make, but we must think through very, very thoroughly. So, uh, trust me, there are no tangible facts that would indicate that an active against campaign before the amendment vote would have done any sort of good. What were your three most recent mistakes? Staying with the Yabloka party for so long. Okay. But that wasn't my last mistake. Um, 
<laughs> going to Tomsk. That wasn't a mistake, of course. It was absolutely the right decision. I, I, I think that we would have destroyed United Russia in Tomsk even without the poisoning. It was absolutely the right thing to do. I made, I make tons of technical mistakes in my management of the foundation that I just name two more. Uh, we we picked wrong on 15% of candidates for our smart voting. Here it is yet again, mm-hmm. which is still better than last time. We were right on 75% of candidates this time during the election. And last election, we were right on 69%. Mistakes were made. We made mistakes with the individual candidates. But if you want to hear about some critical, defining mistake, I think we've produced a system that prevented obvious mistakes that could have been. But again, subjective mood. No one knows what it would have led to. Maybe had I used some sharp phrase, things would have gone differently in 2012. In 2012, I think we made a lot of mistakes. No one could have foreseen it back then, by the way. I think in 2012, everyone was full of optimism and said that we didn't need to push the government because it would fall apart itself and Putin would leave himself in two months' time. Uh, It was absolutely the wrong approach. So same thing, we don't know. You mentioned Belarus several times, right? Uh, maybe maybe Tikhanovsky or someone else could have done something differently, but it's useless to talk about it now. Her current actions seem to be impeccable. What would you have done differently in 2012? In 2012, we should have confirmed after the first reality. Sure, the authorities didn't flinch. And I'm not even storm talking the about Kremlin. We should have continued storm just... The, storm the Kremlin. Storm the Kremlin. Storm the Kremlin is a figurative phrase. Go go free everyone. So go to the detention center and make them release absolutely everyone and keep the rally going. So just not spook them once and then expect that they got so spooked that they can't pull it together and regroup. Keep pushing instead. And I think that it could have worked in 2012, but what's the point of talking about this? There's no point in reliving 2012 time and time again and lamenting, oh, we should have gone to the Revolution Square, not about Lodna. It's all completely useless now. I never suggested it. No, but I was just talking about the amendments. As just the, the amendments. amendments uh, I am positive that their decision-making looked a little bit like this. They sat down and said, once we announce the constitutional amendments, they will obviously campaign to vote against. So, we need to do a number of things in advance to void both the old constitution and the campaign against the amendments, so it won't be a referendum at all. The the vote will have completely different rules. And additionally, the new constitution will be passed in all federal subjects beforehand. They were prepared, so an against campaign would have really done nothing. Can you tell a little about yourself? Your parents often come up in discussion. Mm-hmm. Who are your parents? I'm from Moscow. I was born and raised in Moscow. I graduated from the Plehanov Academy, majoring in international relations. My mom worked uh, at the Ministry of Light Industry as an ordinary employee, and my dad worked at the Research Institute, but my parents divorced when I was probably in the fifth grade. When I was 18, my dad passed away. They say your dad worked for the KGB. You know, it's a strange story. I understand not the KGB, but the GRU. I've read it, and it's a very strange story. I saw that everywhere they write, it's according to Ksenia Subchak's words. I think it's better to ask her. I can't say that I feel great about Ksenia, but I think she couldn't have made up such a story. You mean... Well, because it's a fabricated story and the circumstances described in that article, which you probably also read, that my dad was the director or, no, not the director, but the GRU general or something like that. It's just a super fabricated story. Who did you work as? I graduated from college, then worked at a bank, and then somewhat quickly met and started dating Alexei. We got married, and I quit my job. Then Dasha was born. Later, I worked a bit. I had a small business, uh, well, for a couple of years. And then it became clear that Alexei was into politics, politics and more politics. And so I focused on the family and left my job. Uh, what kind of business was it? It was, it was, uh, I was helping Alexei's parents who were selling uh, wicker furniture. 
You're on the same page politically, right? Yeah. What's your beef? I mean, what do you dislike? What don't I like about the Yes, in modern Russia. I don't like corruption. I don't like um, the power pressing on officials. I don't like what I've seen in the Omsk hospital when I saw that uh, the chief doctor must always be a United Russia deputy. I faced all this directly. He's afraid to say anything extra. His hands trembled and he was shaking because of his... Not afraid for the patients. He doesn't care about them. He's afraid of what his bosses will say to him. Those people from the regional administration come and they influence the doctors. It's uh, scary because this administration is much scarier for the doctors than uh, something happening to a patient. This is, of course, a big problem. The current authority. Instead of urging people to go vote against the amendments, you focused on smart voting. Yes. Explain briefly why you still consider this a good strategy. Because a united Russia is the foundation of our current government. Putin rules Russia because he has a political infrastructure through which he controls every city. Uh-huh. in every federal subject. It's called the United Russian Party. That's why you need to break its fight against yes. it. Yeah. Suppose that every election across the country, United Russia's candidates lose all offices to liberal democratic, mm-hmm. a.k.a. LDPR, and communist parties. Are you really sure they will make decisions not sanctioned by the Russian president? So let's turn east is the way, I believe, and look to the city of Khabarovsk, where they elected an LDPR governor, as well as an LDPR majority, to the governments of uh, both the city and the Khabarovsk Krai. And it's certainly a corrupt, Kremlin-controlled party, but the system is rigged in such a way that in the absence of monopoly, they at least start to argue and fight amongst themselves, and you get political life. Struggle between the Kremlin towers that don't exist, but struggle between different forces produces political life, making people's lives a little bit better, and then the governments a little bit worse. So whenever other powers win and dilute the United Russia's monopoly, then it is a positive outcome. So take Moscow City Duma. We helped a lot of communists get in, and all our candidates were banned. But most of these communists are great people. They do really great things. And they don't have the majority in Duma right now, but the current Duma is much, much better than the previous one because we eroded United Russia's monopoly. Does it affect Moscow Mayor Sergei Sobyanyan's decisions at the Duma? Of course it does. They used to own all 45 of the seats. He knew that all 45 would always nod along mindlessly. These days, Sobyanyan hates reporting to the deputies because 20% of these deputies now jump up and start giving it to him like he's never had it before, ever. But does it in any way interrupt the process that Ryder Glukovsky called happiness enforcement? Uh, Of course it does. Of course it does. As I said, the authorities change, the they authorities, cancel retiling, and the authorities at, uh, at least have to react to new sources of pressure. Some mm. sort of like uh, if, if, the benefit is the pressure. I got. If no it. one nags them about the tiling, they will steal ninety nine percent of the budget, not forty. Okay, look, smart voting. Here are some of the people that smart voting urged to support. Anatoly Lisitsyn, ex-governor of Yaroslav Oblast, a faithful member of United Russia until, like, recently. There are also some reports about his business schemes in Yaroslav Oblast. I don't know if it's true, but if it is, it's just crazy. So smart voting urged people to vote for him. He was competing against a United Russian, some sort of hockey player. Andrei Kovalenko, yes. another great person. Yeah. Well, it was either Lisitsyn or a pro-government candidate. And I don't know about his reasoning, but he decided to fight United Russia. And we helped him, I hoped, and he destroyed this hockey player, I believe, yes? He lost. The hockey player got the seat. Oh, did he? Yeah. Well, damn. Well, see, I guess I've missed uh, a lot during this month. And I, I don't care what Lisitsyn is like. The people that they allow to run these days aren't really great people, unfortunately, because 
I think it's because they usually don't let ours run. The goal is to destroy United Russia's monopoly. Couldn't it be rigged? Couldn't he have left United Russia to get on the smart voting radar, so to speak, then uh, win the election? Well, well, he didn't, but assuming he did. And then? Continue with the, I don't know. Well, this happened in Novosibirsk. The communists in United Russia struck a deal in Novosibirsk, which put us through a tough spot because we did good work in Novosibirsk, but it was really tough because we went up against rigged competition. And of course they can rig it. Lots of things can happen, but that's just par for the course in our situation. Another person that smart My voting God, supported was... Loose? I think he lost 34 to 40. Well, maybe it was, but... It was the by-election to the well, Duma, yeah, right? Yeah, I guess the Duma yeah. by-election, and I guess it was another hallucination because I thought that it's in one. Novosibirsk, Rostislav Antonov. Yeah? Some of his achievements. Supported the annexation of Crimea and the Donbass campaign. Voted in favor of the amendments. Antonov's organization... He sued me. You think that I don't know these things? I'm telling the ah, viewers. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Antonov's organization petitioned to rename the street in Ukta after Motorola a.k.a. Uh, Arseny Pavlov, one of the leaders of Donetsk People's Republic, and he called some people that brought flowers to Nimtsov Bridge worms. So, how does this work? It works like this. There are no super nice folks on election ballots these days. I get going back to Moscow City Duma. Have you seen Sobol, Yashin, Zhdanov, or other ACF members on those ballots? They will not let decent people with a chance to win run ever, because they won't allow such nonsense, especially post-Belarus and Tikhanovska. You have to always keep in mind that, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, by the way, people that won in Tomsk and Novosibirsk had Navalny's team next to their names in the ballots. Saboyko, head of our team, 44% in Tomsk, Fadeeva. Got over 40%, destroyed the United Russian, by Tiev in Tomsk. Also from the Navalny's team, smashed their utilities mobster with over 50% of the votes, just annihilated them. So, we support a small number of great people, and they will just become deputies, but you have to keep in mind that we will suffer and hurt and wring our hands. But in the near future, and particularly in the Duma election, it's going to hurt. I promise you suffering, Yuri. If you decide to vote in the Duma election, which you will, because it's your principled stance, you always vote. Yes. Well, and, and, and yes, you live in the northeast of Moscow, right? Or is it northwest? So no, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So what, wherever you'll be voting, Putin's strategy goes like this. So Yuri Dude comes in and cries. He soaks the whole ballot with his tears because it is just so bad. That is their strategy. Instead of soaking ballots with tears, we want to try and figure something out. Which of these bad people has a chance to beat the worst one. As revolting as some of the bios that you could expose here get, the worst light in any scumbag's bio would be member of the United Russian Party. Our goal is to erode their monopoly. I understand Leonid Volkov doesn't live in Russia. Leonid Volkov doesn't live in Russia. He left after the criminal case? The case against him, yes. Uh, for how long? Mm, several months, but he's not underpinning arrest or anything like that. We just figured it was inevitable because the fact that he is an important person on our team and we preferred to not give them the pleasure of that uh, in a detention center or under house arrest or something like that, he'd be less useful than he would be when he was free. And how do you discuss these things with ACF members? Uh, they tyrannize you, but you stay when someone else leaves. Are you always okay with that? Of course. It's everyone's personal choice. I can't, ex I can't expect people to, even though ACF has gathered some seriously messed up people, they just know what's in store when they join. Which is why, despite the unprecedented pressure in the recent years, barely anyone's left, and only a few left the country, in Moscow and outside of it. But when you're facing criminal charges, just, just keep in mind, the man has a family, parents, and children. And of course, it's everyone's personal choice, and I will never insist on anything. I just, I do my best to let the person mull it over themselves and to make it clear that there's no pressure on my part. I can't tell them. I'd really prefer if you stayed. Because after they lock him up, his wife will come to me in tears and say, it's your fault that he's in jail.
I brought up Volkov because a wonderful comment he posted introduced me to another smart voting back candidate. Look, so you urged people to vote for a candidate named Gubenko, an adamant Stalin fan and Putin supporter. And when asked about the reasoning behind it, Volkov said, we cannot recommend no one. Kubenko was suggested to us by Yelena Rusakova, who'd been denied registration in the district. Her explanation was amusing, yet sound. Kubenko is 79. There's a high chance for a snap election, which she hopes to win. In plain terms, Sad, but translating right. from political to plain language, this means he's old. We hope he'll die soon. And there will be a revo. No, Wilby didn't say that. Lenny Volkov, Volkov said, said that, but it, it doesn't matter. Well, Volkov uh, passed it on. Uh, Kubenko died this uh, summer. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's just so rude. It, it most certainly wasn't the main reason. We would have most likely supported Kubenko either way, because when I said that to you, and then people like you, Yuri, would soak their ballots with tears after this Duma election, I wasn't exaggerating. In, in in all of the best districts, Kubeka ran in the Gagarin district. It's the most valuable district in Moscow to win. So obviously, they only registered candidates that you couldn't vote for without suffering at all. And then this will continue. Our goal was very simple, defiantly beat the United Russia candidate. And we did defiantly beat him by electing a fairly stinky God rest his soul and all of that, Gubyanka. But it doesn't matter at all. In one of the districts, as you know, we elected a double. We had a candidate named Solovyov, and they refused him registration, but they sent a double with the last name of Solovyov. We ended up electing him. In, in terms of rhetoric, he was worse than any Gubyanka. But who cares? I, he thing the United Russia I lost. meant the phrasing. When Volkov well, says something no, like I that, I think that this was taken out of context. It's a YouTube well, comment. I have a screenshot. A uh, Facebook comment, rather. I have a screenshot. Well, uh, it's not something that Leonid I know would say. Did you read the Love Confession post before it went public, or did he show it to you before posting it to social media? Well, it was more of. I think I wasn't very aware of the depth of the post. More like, of course, I read all your comments. I was uh, more pleased than you liked it so much that um, I think Alexei is such, you'll think he's tough and closed off, that he somehow expresses his emotions. I don't think uh, so. Well, to me, it was like, you know, like, my heart was exploding. <laughs> I can't say. Let's briefly discuss journalists. Can you explain why you react so sharply to everything concerning Tatiana Lysova? Did you at all regret your Facebook confrontation with uh, Ivan Galinov? No. Moreover, it's a principled stance. Lysova was a brilliant journalist. She backslid and became a bad one. Whenever good journalists become bad ones, I was determined to destroy them publicly because you have to do it. You just, you just, you really have to. These people have to be pressured as well. They're bad journalists. I'm not saying that Lysova is a bad journalist. She's not. She just betrayed journalism at some point, and she's with Medusa today, and maybe does some good things there. Betrayed? You mean when she joined TASS? When she joined TASS? When TASS published articles about a gas pop in a residential building, she didn't quit. She just pretended like nothing was happening. She was the head of the politics department. TASS was lying. She stayed with the media that lied, day after day. I won't forgive the journalists that I like. No one. Be it Lizisa or... Who are some of the creme de la creme journalists that I'm friends with today, the ones that I speak with now? If, if they were to join TASS tomorrow, they will get it 100 times worse. Moreover, the journalists that I like today, if they join Russia Today and Simonyan, the harshness of my rhetoric against them will be greater if they're great journalists today, much more, especially. What about your vocabulary, like um, a little liar or investigative journalists cannot hold a candle to ACF's team? 
Are you sure throwing around such language and insults is the best? Well, I don't think that they're insults. It's the honest-to-goodness truth. Journalists don't hold a candle to ACF's investigators but at all. But you see yourself you see yourself as the future president of Russia. Is this really the level of minutia you want to get involved with? Even now, not being the president. It just seems such a triviality to start a fistcuffs over. But you do it anyway. Freedom of media and journalism is definitely not a triviality. Absolutely. It's a it's, crucial issue. Well, I, practically here. I use individual examples to discuss the entire system. Certainly one of my downsides. I'm not even arguing. You asked about my mistakes and whether leaders of the opposition backslid. I know this about myself. One of my flaws is that I'm prone to uh, using s- certain epithets that I should use less often or stay away from. I definitely get personal. It's a part of my political strategy, I suppose, if you will, because I got into politics to criticize specific people, among other things, and I got into politics. I fight corruption. Not as a phenomenon, but as individual corrupt officials, crooks that I hate, I always call them by their names. It's my principled stance. It obviously means a lot of emotional and personal language, unfortunately, because it's a flaw overall. I admit this, but it's a part of who I am. Your words that caused an outrage were, um, they don't know Pushkin in Uzbekistan. Is it the same flaw? I said, it was a slip of the tongue, not not Uzbekistan, it's Kazakhstan. Uzbekistan. Well, well, obviously no one knows who Pushkin was in Uzbekistan. Well, it was a classic slip of the tongue. I said nonsense, certainly. Just a classic classic situation. And I, I said something dumb. So it was nonsense. Well, of course it was. So they do know Pushkin is in Uzbekistan. Of course they do. Uzbekistan is a huge country. Tens of millions of people. And a lot of them know who Pushkin was. Some don't, but some Russians don't either. We filmed our first interview three years ago in spring 2017. In short, how did Russia change since then? A funny thing, preparing for this interview, I watched the last one and read some questions, and it it went 2017, they threw Brilliant Green at you. 2020, they threw Nevichok at you. There were a lot of funny comments. The best comment was was this one. Um, In 2017, the interview starts with the words, Alexei, a week ago, you came out of the detention center. In 2020, the interview starts with, Alexei, three weeks ago, you came out of coma. coma. And how has Russia changed? Russia got poorer. Russia sadly regressed. Let's just look at some of the projects that they tried to realize here. The Sukhoi Superjet, does it fly? No, it, it does, doesn't. But it has issues. It barely flies. Don't say that. It does fly. Well, it flies with the issues. It has issues, but all yes. all foreign countries turned it down. Yes. No one buys it except for Aeroflot because they're forced to. Yeah. They built the Vostochny Cosmodrome, embezzling unconscionable sums of money. They got a different launch pad. It's all really bad. So none of Putin's projects were successful. Russia regressed in everything. By the way, on the matter of finishing the job, the system can't progress in everything but evolve in killing. Apparently, it's also regressed in its ability to kill. But that part's fortunate. So since the time that we, well, since our last interview, Russia has regressed uh, substantially. It definitely can be sensed. And they passed the pension reform since then. How did you change as a politician in these three and a half years? I probably certainly become more ruthless. And life made us this way, you know? These days, our organization operates under constant Mm, uh, constant pressure. This morning news, they broke down our, our Hangel's coordinator's door. It's now a part of our lives. It's just got out of attention center this time, and I've spent a lot more time under arrest since. All of our people have spent a lot of time under arrest since. Men, women, everyone. 
number of criminal charges went up immeasurably. They now use ways to pressure us we couldn't even imagine back then. We responded uh, to increased pressure quite effectively, in my opinion, by getting stronger and become better survivors. It couldn't have not resulted in us becoming more desperate and a bit more aggressive. So I think that there are pros and cons to this on a personal level as well. I got an impression from one of your speeches, which I'd like to transform into a question. The assembly regarding police brutality, the Moscow City Duma election, and the Moscow case of September 2019, uh, when you had a speech at the end. I didn't come... uh, To the stage specifically, I stayed in the thick of it among the thousands of attendees. So my impression was, first off, on my way from the subway, I saw a bunch of guys from um, law enforcement. I don't know who they were, maybe internal troops or police or whatever. A ton of them. And young guys, many of them recognized me. They seemed really uh, happy to see me and uh, some other people. And then Navalny comes out. Uh, the headliner of the gig. And your speech, which was very aggressive, immediately turned to people in black hats, as you called them. There they are with black hats, smiling at us and, and, and gloating. Your entire speech was filled with aggression and hostility towards people that uh, provide security at events and work in law enforcement. People at the assembly were ecstatic. Uh, at some point, the crowd shouted, Copras disgrace Russia, and uh, all that stuff. And I had a thought at that time. Alexei, wouldn't it have been better to come out and instead of saying things your followers expected to hear, to address the people on the other side? Because this was the fall of the Moscow case. It was the moment where their savagery and brutality and that punch in the woman's stomach made everyone, including a lot of loyalists, to go, what the frick? Everyone knew that those events were insanity. Shouldn't you have tried to broaden your audience with that speech and maybe talk to them Instead of using the obvious rhetoric about crooks and and thieves, talking to those who already follow you. That's when I thought, what if one of Alexei Navalny's flaws is that despite the great relationship he built with his supporters, he cannot break out of this circle to reach those who are apprehensive of or dislikes you. And explain to them using calm, non-hostile language. Guys, there's a greater chance to build something awesome with me rather than with people that you back today for sentimental or monetary reasons. Your reasoning is perfectly sound in theory. Well, in practice, too. We dedicate a lot of time to this. We dedicate a lot of time to this. And it's a politician's job to broaden their audience, which is why we also worked with the ombudsman of the police who got arrested. We helped the police union. And I spent a lot of time working with this part of the state system. Well, I just, I think, trust me, a lot of these people sympathize with me and our organization. They do it openly, too. They'll put the handcuffs on me and go, you're, you're actually a great guy. I watch all of your videos. Please get in the van. But during assemblies, I say the things that I believe and that I want to say. That particular meeting was two days after yet another police raid. They broke down our doors. They grabbed people by their arms and legs and dragged them away. They're my colleagues, members of my team. They froze people's uh, child benefits and pensions. Someone's grandma died because they broke in and took her iPad, the only valuable thing she had. And if if these supporters, who'd been brutalized by men in black hats just two days ago, saw me take the mic and go, you know, let's just all forget about it, or something other than that I actually said first, I would have lost them, and second, I couldn't have said anything else. Because at the time, during the Moscow case, when they grabbed and arrested innocent people, when they launched a large-scale operation against our team and lots of other people, I, I just couldn't have found it in me and would have thought that I was a worthless politician. Because if I came out 
And instead of saying the things that I believed and thought were important to say to people uh, at the assembly and came up with a more clever plan, I think I need a different speech to broaden my influence. Of course, I could have probably said something better. You can beat any speech with a better one, any time, always. And, uh, well, you could call this a primitive approach, right? I wear my heart on my sleeve, and I say what I feel at rallies. Maybe it's a flaw, but also a merit. Does it scare you that this could end up shutting the doors into big politics for you? I'm more scared of one day succumbing to thoughts such as, I think, I have to become a big politician. I have to become a big politician. All my actions have to further the idea that I have. Get an extra percent or percent and a half. This moment when political necessity would trump my sincerity and faith in my cause. But I think, luckily, we pull people, don't we? We see that our audience is growing. Our candidates in Tomsk annihilated the United Russian particularly because of our aggressiveness. We did an investigation that showed that these crooks and thieves have robbed the people of Tomsk. People of Tomsk went, holy moly, and gave our candidates 50% of the votes. It works. Polls show that our organization's ratings and mine are rising. Isn't politics about being crafty? Not for me. Russian politics is, in general, isn't about craftiness. What are your plans? Uh, recover. No one knows it fully, then I'm coming back. Uh, how long are you going to stay in Germany? I don't know. The doctors say, I ask them, when will my hands stop shaking and I can go back to a normal life? Uh, to which they say, you know, Alexei, there's not a lot of applicable experience here, so we'll watch you and then we'll know how long it takes. It may take three weeks or two months, but... but so it could be two weeks or, or a year? Well, I'm almost sure it won't be a year. I, I don't know, not a year probably. But, I mean, I mean, definitely not. But two months sounds plausible. But I mean, two, may, two months maybe. Uh, what could make you not come back to Russia? That's not an option. Have you put a timer on how long you would stay in politics? If you put a timer on it, then you're a bad politician and shouldn't be in politics. This is what I tell myself. What about an inner one? Because you still got to feel like you're running in circles. I don't feel like that at all. Not even remotely. Uh-huh. So just remember, we had this dumb little play where you praised the Belarusians, and I was the United Russian repeating, so what? Right? People, the The people that say, so what, are the people who think that I'm running in circles. That's not the case at all, whatsoever. And so our audience and numbers of supporters are growing. We have 40 regional offices. We didn't just survive. We have 40 offices that dominate political opposition in the country, which I'm pretty sure was the reason they resorted to extreme measures. And we are now growing. We're growing. Our percentages are going up. We successfully win elections that they don't even let us run in. More and more people watch us now. We conduct great investigations, and this is not me singing a note to myself. There are still mistakes and problems, but... I would say that we're climbing with a lot of difficulty rather than running in circles. And most importantly, again, I, I feel in my heart, I, I feel that I'm right, that I'm surrounded by people who believe in what they're doing as well. And it's an amazing thing to do something you love and to be supported by others as you go along this path. Not afraid to return to Russia. We will definitely return to Russia. Uh, the only thing is when he was still in hospital, uh, not even discharged, but he already came to me at some point. I told him, I understand that you want to return as soon as possible, but I implore you to recover completely first and then come back because I don't know what awaits us in Russia. And if you come back not fully recovered, Perhaps uh, the second time they won't be able to save you. And I think uh, he heard me. So for me, uh, honestly, such a question has never arisen. He's a person who is so passionate, uh, enthusiastic, and uh, doing a great job, genuinely 
just trying to make the world better, genuinely trying to make the country better. Maybe it sounds too beautiful, yes, but that's uh, the truth. I never said and won't say anything to make him stop doing this. I like what he does and I support what he does. I want him to continue doing it. I would be very disappointed if he at some point says, uh, well, you know, my health isn't very good, I won't continue. Do your female friends often say, well, Yulia, I couldn't have done that? Yeah, of course. What do you reply? When they say I couldn't do that, nothing well I could. Flash quiz. How old will you be in 2036? Uh, my cognitive abilities have recovered, but not enough to make this trivial. Uh, no matter how old I am, if you're asking whether I will run for office, I will fight for political leadership in 2036. But how old am I going to be? Let's calculate. It was just an age question. Uh, I'm 44 now, so I'll be 60. How old were you in 1999? What are these devilish questions? I will struggle with questions like that, I'm sure. In 1999, 20 years ago, I was 24. And lastly, we're in a strength. Strength is definitely in truth. Sorry for the banality. It's in truth and confidence. Contest. What's our prize for uh, for today? Um, I would love to give away the proverbial bottle, but unfortunately, it's going to lab after lab all over the world. So first, we'll give away a different bottle. Last time, I gave away a bottle of uh, Kagor wine from Medvedev's vineyard, uh, from Medvedev's Russian vineyard, and we're taking it up a notch this time. This time, it'll be a bottle of wine from Medvedev's vineyard in Tuscany. You've uh, kept one since then? Uh, or do you continue? Oh, oh well, you're probably clients Medvedev now. Medvedev hasn't gotten any poorer. Italy hasn't run out of grapes, so they will still make wine. All right, wine? Wine, and as I said today, I started to learn to juggle tennis balls with my physical therapist. So I will side one of these tennis balls, and it will be our second prize. Wonderful. As always, the contest is very simple. Um, well, while you were in the coma, you were nominated for a Nobel Prize. Uh, you were suggested. I think that was a joke. Both you and Putin were suggested well, that was definitely as... A joke. Uh, what was your reaction when you saw Navalny and Nobel Prize in the same uh, sentence? Well, as I said, that I went through a lengthy drug trip, so when I read it, I thought, hmm, the Japanese professor should be here soon. Kurovostok will stand over there, and some other folks that I met in the last few days right over that way. Anyway, uh, you need to reply to the pinned post under this video with uh, your suggestions of a worthy Nobel Peace Prize candidate from your country. Someone more deserving of it than Putin or Navalny, in your opinion. Leave the person's name and briefly explain why. The most interesting suggestion, be it funny, as in a joke, or just cool and unexpected, will win these prizes. Thank you so much. Thank you.